Good morning. I call to order the interactive civil society hearing as part of the preparatory process for the high-level meeting on the fight against tuber tuberculosis. Microphone is on. You need to put this. <laughs> My microphone is on. If you, if you cannot hear me, I suggest that you use the head earphone. So I call to order the interactive civil society hearing as part of the preparatory process for the high-level meeting on the fight against tuberculosis held in accordance with resolution 72 slash 268 of 4th April 2018. This interactive hearing will provide representatives of member states, observers of the General Assembly, parliamentarians, representatives of local government, relevant United Nations entities, non-governmental organizations, academia, medical associations, and the private sector, as well as people affected by tuberculosis and broader communities with an opportunity to share experiences and contribute constructively to the preparations for the high-level meeting. I'd like to warmly welcome you all to today's hearing, and I'll open it with my statement. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the General Assembly decided to hold its first ever high-level meeting on the fight against tuberculosis on 26th of September. In doing so, it also recognized that it is essential to gather the views and ideas of civil society, and that's why we are here today. This hearing is indeed timely. As you know, Tomorrow, Member States will begin negotiations for the outcome document of the high-level meeting. The views of all of you actively engaged in the fight against tuberculosis are essential. Today is your time to place them front and center. Before going further, I want to acknowledge the support of the World Health Organization and the Stop TB Partnership. We have partnered to arrange this important event together. Since assuming office, I have met with many of you. I have felt your energy firsthand, and I know how eager and excited you are to begin. So I will set the stage with three short points. The first is that we cannot continue the way we are going. More action is needed, and it's needed now. Tuberculosis is treatable and curable. Yet every day, it kills more than 4,500 women, children, and men. Around half of the cases are undiagnosed, and 1.6 million people die from the disease each year. It is estimated that the disease will cost the global economy about 1 trillion US dollars by 2030. In 2015, world leaders made a bold commitment to end the tuberculosis epidemic by 2030. But we are not on track to meet this SDG target. The pace of progress has been too slow. Global action and investment fall far short of what's required to end the epidemic. Vulnerable and marginalized segments of the populations are not receiving adequate care. Newer challenges, such as multidrug resistant tuberculosis, are a threat, especially when coupled with other concerns, age-old technology, TB HIV co-infection, and the impact of antimicrobial resistance, for example. And there is the big funding gap, especially in developing countries, some 2.3 billion US dollars in 2017. So we need to ramp up our efforts, and to do so urgently. We know we need more research and development for new drugs and treatments. We need more funding. We need universal access to diagnosis and coverage. And we need partnerships and accountability of all stakeholders. But we cannot stop at just knowing. The high-level meeting must be the turning point for world leaders to go beyond pledges. It must be the time for action. The high-level meeting on 20, September 26th will be therefore crucial. We should not miss the historic opportunity. And that's my second point. It is the time to galvanize global momentum to end tuberculosis. This is our chance to bring much-needed attention to the fight against tuberculosis and trigger action at all levels. 
heads of state and government will be here in New York. So too will be business leaders, the UN system, and key stakeholders from around the world. It will be a moment to bring about change, to focus on the crucial action we need. The declaration that will be adopted must be more than words on paper. It must move us forward in concrete terms towards our goal to end tuberculosis. And here I want to recognize the permanent representatives of Antigua and Barbuda and Japan. They are co-facilitating the consultations on the outcome document. And I know they are committed to producing a concise but robust action-oriented document. As President of the General Assembly, I will do everything I can to make the meeting a success. And convening this hearing today is a major part of that effort. It is essential to engage stakeholders in the fight against tuberculosis. You are on the front lines of this battle. You must be part of the solution. We welcome your valuable contributions to help shape the final outcome of the high-level meeting. Today's hearing is the first opportunity for the General Assembly to hear the views of all stakeholders. We are here to listen to you, to hear of best practices, to exchange experiences and lessons learned, to contribute to a joint vision of how to end tuberculosis by 2030. We will hear from survivors, researchers, practitioners and parliamentarians, activists, academics and advocates, journalists and private sector players. Views from all over the world, vital for a truly global action plan. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as I close, I remind us all of the theme of the high-level meeting, which is united to end tuberculosis. No one stakeholder alone can get it done. We have to join our efforts and bring all players on board. We are gathered here at the United Nations in the home of multilateralism. We can and should use that approach as our inspiration. Coming together, mixing views from different perspectives, devising joint plans for shared concerns, determined to act together in the interests of all. So I encourage you to engage. Take the floor. Give your ideas and proposals. Use this platform. Send a clear and united message from today's gathering. I feel your passion. I know your expertise. I recognize your experience. And so I'm confident at the end of today, that call will be loud and clear. I now invite the Secretary General of the United Nations, His Excellency Antonio Guterres, to make a statement. Excellencies, distinguished civil society representatives, ladies and gentlemen, I must apologize because I'm going to be extremely unpolite. The worst thing I uh, consider uh, uh, should be done is what I'm going to do, which is I'm going to talk to you and then I'm going to leave, which is, of course, a uh, uh, lack of respect because I would love to be here and to listen to you. The problem is that we have several events at the same time and unfortunately I have to be in all of them this morning. So, uh, again, I apologize, I will be extremely unpolite, but that doesn't mean lack of respect or lack of interest for the debate, and my uh, colleagues will keep me fully informed about uh, how the session uh, moves on and about the very important contributions that we will give for our common endeavor. I am indeed delighted to be with all of you, and I thank the President of the General Assembly, together with World Health Organization and the Stop TV Partnership, for gathering us here today. And I'd also like to thank the leadership of His Excellency Mr. Koro Besso, Permanent Representative of Japan, and His Excellency Mr. Walton Webson, Permanent Representative of Antigua and Barbuda, the co-facilitators of the outcomes of the high-level meeting on the fight against tuberculosis. I commend all your efforts to end tuberculosis, the biggest infectious killer in the world. And this will not be easy. Success will require that we work across sectors to address the social drivers of the disease, poverty, inequality, increasing rates of migration. We must build links across the broader global health agenda, strengthening health systems, ensuring universal health coverage, and addressing anti-microbial resistance. The WHO Global Strategy 20B by 2030 provides a roadmap for progress. 
Continued political leadership and sustainable financing are critical. In these years, I level meeting of the UN General Assembly on tuberculosis and non-communicable diseases provide key opportunities. Let us use this meeting as an opportunity to inform a new way of thinking and working, lifting TB beyond its traditional silo and avoiding fragmentation on the global health community. Let us also look ahead to the 2019 high level meeting on universal health care. Universal health care provides an ideal umbrella to build cohesion across the global health landscape on financing, programming, and accountability. And let us also work to strengthen existing mechanisms, such as the World Health Assembly, to support the technical reviews that are needed to keep us on track. The outcome document from the high level meeting on TB must be concrete and ambitious in its recommendations to ensure global rhetoric is translated to local action in the communities where it matters most. Today's hearing provides a key opportunity for you to help shape the discussion. You have a proven track record of breaking down barriers to treatments, supporting community advocacy, sharpening accountability, and guiding research and development so it benefits the people who need it. The conversations you have today will serve as the foundation for high-level commitments from world leaders. Your vision will ensure that the fight against TB progress progresses with the most vulnerable people at its center. And the United Nations stands firmly behind you and is committed to working together to end this disease once and for all. I wish you a productive dialogue and look forward to seeing you again in September. Thank you. I thank the Secretary General of the United Nations for his statement. I now invite the Assistant Director General for Communicable Diseases of the World Health Organization, Dr. Ren, Ren Mingui, to make a statement. Thank you. Honorable Antonio Gurriers, Secretary General of the United Nations. Honorable Miroslav Lajek, President of General Assembly. Dr. Lushika Dichu, Executive Director of Stop TB Partnership. Dr. Eric Gusby, United Nations Special Envoy on TB. Ms. Ingroy Skuman, TB Advocacy and Survivor. My sisters, brothers from among the people affected with TB civil society, communities, our member states, partners, ladies and gentlemen. I'm addressing you on behalf of Dr. Tedros Adolphus Ghebreyesus, Dr. General of World Health Organization. He personally asked me to convey his great regrets to you for not being able to join this meeting. He reaffirms his strong commitment to be engaged with you in our joint fight to NTB as evidenced by the various interactions he has had with you since he took office. He met about 100 civil society participants of the World of WHO Global Ministerial Conference on NDTB in Moscow before the opening. As a follow-up of that discussion, he met with representative TB civil society in face-to-face -face meeting on January 15, 16, 2018 in Geneva. He reached out to WHO country and regional representatives, urging them to proactively engage with the society and affect the community through strengthened action towards ending TB, including towards the UN high-level meeting. As many of you can attest, he worked towards engaging open dialogue with you to identify and discuss key issues and joint actions to strengthen civil society engagement to end the TB epidemic. In addition, the cluster on communicable disease that I lead has prioritized engage with civil society cross efforts to end epidemics. On TB issues, Dr. Teresa Kasava, Director of Global TB Programs, and her team 
has been working closely with you. We are all deeply committed to ending TB. Now I will share with you the statements from Dr. Tedros. This is a historic year for fighting against tuberculosis, the world's top infectious killer. The UN high-level meeting on TB gave us a unique opportunity to build a concerned movement from the high levels, highest levels to grassroots, to reach the world's its ancient disease. The last year global minister conference on ending TB in Moscow, this year's TB summit in Delhi, as well as the communities of G20, BRICS countries, APEC, and G7, and the World Health Sum Assembly has just two you know, weeks ago, has given us unprecedented political momentum for ending TB. Civil society organizations has played a key role in building that momentum and for putting the spotlight on ending TB. Today's civil society meeting is vital for ensuring that we make the most high-level meeting. We would like to see the same active engagement of civil society that helps shape 2030 agenda for sustainable development and the sustainable development goals. This is also why WHO has proactively strengthened our collaboration with civil society on TB since I took office last year. I believe in the transforming power of civil society to drive change, change that will impact the lives of millions of people worldwide who are dying or suffering from TB. I would like to see a 100 hands of states at a UN high-level meeting committing to end TB, just like President Putin and Prime Minister Modi. And I would like to see commitment to ensure that no one with TB is left behind, which is one of the key actions that TB community is calling for. The recently launched Find, Treat, and All initiative of T WHO Stop TB Partnership Global Fund, Civil Countries, Civil Society, and Partners aims to do the exact this, reaching 40 million people with TB, which quality care by 2022. You, my dear brothers and sisters, can make this happen. Together, we can ensure the political commitment is translated into a concrete actions and investment. Together we can end TB. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you all in New York in September. I thank the Assistant Director General for Communicable Diseases of the World Health Organization for the statement. I now invite Dr. Luchika Dityu, Executive Director of the Stop TB Partnership, to make a statement. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I am the Executive Director of Stop TB Partnership. Several of us know each other very well, but because several might not know, we are a United Nations-based partnership, so we are part of the UN. And uh, it's a very important moment and an, an historical opportunity, as we said here, that several years ago, several of us didn't believe it can happen. And it was the leadership of our board, Minister of South Africa, Motsu Aledi, that challenged all of us in the Stop TB Partnership Board by saying, TB will never ever get closer unless we get the attention of the heads of states. And the only way to do that is have a United Nations meeting on TB. And several of us at that time rolled our eyes and said, yes, sure. And uh, that was uh, in early 2016. And at the board in September 2016, together with the first lady of Nigeria and several ministers of health from Mozambique, Nigeria, uh, and uh, India and Brazil, there was a call to have this UN high level meeting. And here we are today. Uh, I want to start by thanking you, uh, your excellency, uh, President of the General Assembly and your team and my colleagues from WHO for the efforts that we all did to ensure that we have such a, an amazing room here. And as we rightly said, we are coming from the TB community here 
being civil society, people affected by TB, parliamentarians, technicians, to make a case that it is time to do something about this disease. This is a meeting not about briefing us with us, as we are doing very often in the TB world. This is a meeting in which we want to interact with the missions that are then part of the entire discussions going forward for the final outcome of the UN high-level declaration. And I am very happy to see here in the room a lot of known faces, and I see very few unknown faces, and I hope that more of the missions will come and join us. Because in TB we have a problem. For years and years and years we spoke between ourselves. We spoke and cried about the fact that we don't have enough tools, that we don't have enough funding, that we don't have enough scale, but we were crying on the shoulder of each other and we need, didn't have the right audience. And the right audience that we need to have are the heads of states and the heads of governments and the governments themselves that are able to do something for the life of their people. And I see here few missions, but I see here very few missions, and I really hope that they will join us somehow, because otherwise the dream of Dr. Tedros, and the, that you very nicely said, Ren, of having a, a hundred heads of states, it will become a simple dream. The UN high-level meeting is an historical opportunity, indeed, if we are able to make it together. And we want or not, together with the ambassadors of Japan and Antigua, together with the PGA, uh, together with the UNSG, we are in the same boat. We will remain in history because this is the first time we have a meeting on TB. There were already four for HIV. There were already three for NCDs. This is the first one and very likely the only one for TB. So we make it or we break it. To make it, we need to ensure that at the end of it, we have a declaration that you, Your Excellency, said very well. It has very concrete steps forwards and is not just a piece of paper that will be signed and will remain somewhere in the cupboards. We came here in front of you, dear colleagues from missions, as a TB community, very united, but also very frustrated because we never had enough and we never raised our voice to be able to push the end of the disease. For thousands of years, this disease killed people quietly because very often the people that this disease killed are the ones that come from the most marginalized and vulnerable that are not visible for the press, for the media, or are not very comfortable to deal with. It's time to be serious and unless we change something and unless we make this UN high-level meeting very well attended and with a very concrete outcome, we will never end TB. It's not about only that, it's about the fact that TB, which is curable, is a disease that represents a risk for all of us. Somebody told me, none of the heads of states will really move unless it becomes personal. It is personal because this disease is airborne and there, if there is a disease that will make all of us sick, irrespective of what we eat, irrespective of how much exercise we do, irrespective of how much we don't smoke, that's TB. And it is curable. And the fact that in 2018, we have children dying of TB. We have women losing their lungs on sensitive TB. And we have drugs that are worse than a chemotherapy is unacceptable. But I call on all of us because 80% in this room is us from the TB community. We need to be united between now and September and make sure that the heads of states attend this meeting because if in September it will be a meeting attended just by the ministers of health, we are failing. We can end TB, we need the support of the leaders, we need your support, Excellency co-facilitators, the PGA and UNSG. Thank you very much. I thank the Executive Director of Stop TB Partnership for her statement. I now invite Dr. Eric Gusby, United Nations Special Envoy on Tuberculosis, to make a stand statement. Thank you very much, President of the General Assembly, the Secretary General to both permanent representatives from uh, Antigua, Japan, uh, Your Excellencies, thank you for this convening. 
It's good to be here with you today. Why? In part because the fact that sometimes civil society isn't always necessarily civil, and we shouldn't want it any other way. That, le that lent to accountability, the acknowledgement uh, that you are being um, monitored, and that the expectations have been set, and we need to reach them together. I know firsthand that if it wasn't for civil society, there would not have been an AIDS movement as robust as it was and is, the likes of which we have never seen to that date before. AIDS truly did change everything when it comes to advocacy, and civil society advocates were and remain the agents of that change. If I can quote a passage from the UN publication, UN AIDS publication, and I quote, in the beginning there was advocacy. Before there was a name for the disease, before the money, before the institutions, there was a movement of people who demanded answers, resources, and a voice. Public health officials had never faced such a strategy. Early AIDS activists applied political activism tactics. They made health a human right. They also made it their business to understand the science behind the disease, even as researchers were learning about it themselves. This combination made for a powerful advocacy platform." Close quotes. There are those of us in this room who remember those days. These were days of despair as we watched our loved ones uh, perish, and these were also days of hope. Hope that our world leaders would make ending this deadly disease a priority. Hope that they would come together, as they did in 2001, for the first ever UN Conference on AIDS to demonstrate to all who would listen that beating AIDS was possible with more resources and more commitment. We find ourselves today at a similar crossroads in our fight against TB. We have been at war with TB for centuries. For the last few years, it has surpassed AIDS as the world's leading infectious disease killer, a distinction that no one should be proud of achieving. But like these and those days at the beginning of the century, when, with the UN high-level meeting on AIDS, there is also a reason for optimism. I believe that we are becoming part of a movement that says it is TB's time. We saw it as the historic meeting in Moscow last November when President Putin, in his keynote speech, expressed his personal commitment to ending tuberculosis in Russia. And in March, Prime Minister Modi, uh, reaffirmed his government's commitment to NTB by 2025 and stressed the need for all partners to come together to reach this goal. But it cannot be TB's time without you, civil society. To me, there are five critical actions that civil society has taken and we must all build upon them if we are going to be successful. First, educate, activate, and fight stigma in all its ugly forms. It's up to those of you in this room, those of us in the country-based programs, delivery systems, to be held accountable for changing the culture that does not identify, enter, and embrace, retain people in care for the duration of their treatments. Make sure that we and our leaders from Washington to Kenya know that TB does not have to be a death sentence, and those who are suffering from TB do not need the added burden of being stigmatized by their governments, their friends, and even their families, as well as the medical delivery system. TB is everywhere, and everyone is a potential victim. To stigmatize one is to stigmatize all. Secondly, continue to fight for long-awaited, patient-centered global responses. It took a long time for all of us to be gathered in this room today, and then again in three months for the high-level meeting, but we are here. It is the beginning of this, and we won't go away. The September 26th is the beginning of the end of tuberculosis, not the end of the beginning. Give voice to the voiceless. You are representing many people who don't have political clout. To take nothing away from the AIDS advocates, they had resources and, uh, uh, and fought for them, and they had voices that they had to develop and mature to be the resounding clarity of accountability, expectation, and ethics. But when it comes to tuberculosis, you're fighting for people primarily who are living in poverty, many of whom don't know where to go to be tested or treated, let alone become an advocate 
for the cause. You are their voice, and you are those who will train and create opportunities to develop and mature that voice. Push for innovation, push for R&D. It's fine to say we have a cure, but we all know it isn't a good cure. It involves numerous drugs, multiple months of treatment with side effects that are unacceptable. We really are smart enough to do this better, and it's time to do it. Finally, and push for resources is the bottom line underlying theme in all of those first four points. 10.4 million people worldwide living with tuberculosis, 4 million not identified, means that we not only uh, are potentially uh, pre pre allowing those individuals to look at death, but it also means that TB continues to be transmitted in the same places that we had identified tuberculosis, but had not taken the time to thoroughly evaluate the extent of that outbreak. Clearly, at the current pace of diagnosis and treatment and research development, we are not going to be capable of breaking the transmission chain, despite the most commendable efforts of so many of the organizations in this room. In order to end TB, we need many things to do it right. We clearly need better tools to diagnose TB and to get to the forgotten four million. We need stable referral systems and much more decentralized approaches to care. We need to be better un to better understand the critical role that uh, providers and those in the private sector community play. The private sector needs to be understood and used as a part of the medical delivery system that extends into different aspects, different portions of the population. But to really bend the transmission curve, we also desperately need a vaccine that truly protects people by preventing the occurrence of the disease or preventing infection to start over, preventative and therapeutic. Over a billion dollars has been spent cumulatively in a search for an AIDS vaccine and just about 100 million has been spent for tuberculosis. Not to belittle or take away from the need for HIV at all, but to highlight the need for more resources to pour into the tuberculosis vaccine effort. When world leaders gather here in September, we must remind them that we are not just talking about numbers, we're talking about people. More than 4,500 people die every day from tuberculosis. Each one is connected to a family, a community. Each one is part of a social system, a society, and part of the national strength. Each one leaves that family, that community, often in devastation, personally and economically. World leaders must join us in our fight for not only more resources, but significantly more resources. Here in the United States, we must be aggressive in insisting that the United States and other donor countries continue to uh, support and increase the support of those agencies within their countries that funnel resources to program. And if compassion doesn't win our leaders over, then let's also tell them that fighting TB is one of the best investments in global health, a dollar buying you $43 in return. We're all tired of having to fight for every nickel and dime for tuberculosis. But that is the way our world is structured, and it is the only path we have to identify and expand the resources needed. We are tired of it, of TB being less than the center of attention, and I know you are too, but this begins the moment when we pivot into a more accelerated, aggressive response to a disease we know how to prevent, diagnose, treat, cure, et cetera. I leave this one thought with you. In drafting the upcoming Lancet Commission report on TB, we interviewed a young woman from India, Nandita, who survived two battles against tuberculosis. When asked what message she would bring to world leaders attending the high-level meeting, and I'm quoting her, she said, every decision you make affects the life of millions of like me irreversibly. So it's imperative that survivors are involved in policy making and decision making. The worldview of someone who has seen the disease firsthand will give tremendous input and insight to target change in the right direction. That's not a one-time contribution, but an ongoing repetitive interface. 
Nandita is spot on. Our leaders cannot do this without you. We on this stage cannot do this without you. You give voice to the voiceless, and I am proud that this meeting has been convened and that we begin that long march to MTB. I thank the United Nations Special Envoy on Tuberculosis for his statement. And I now invite Ms. Ingrid Schumann of TB Proof to make a statement. Good morning, distinguished guests. What happened to me is the ex exception. I sit here today, I'm happy, I'm healthy. Having been given a voice and platforms, I contribute to society and economically. But the reality is that for most people, life after TB is extremely hard. I worked in a children's hospital, um, which I loved as a dietitian, and that is where I contracted drug-resistant TB, diagnosed by a lung biopsy. The medication that was used to treat the TB is what caused me to go into a coma liver, due to liver failure, and that nearly killed me. For 75 days, I was in hospital. I suffered physically. I was bedridden, vomiting, having diarrhea. Emotionally, I really struggled to cope. I, I, I wanted to give up. I'm grateful that God saved my life, and I'm glad TB happened to me. It, it changed me to my core. I became aware of the immense suffering that people affected by TB are going through. If I felt so overwhelmed, despite having tremendous support from loved ones, access to great medical care, kindness from hospital staff, how do the majority of people with TB, who don't even have food on the table to eat, how do they get through this? All representatives of member states, Office of the General Assembly, and co-facilitators, let us stop this suffering. The truth is, any of you could have been in my shoes. TB spreads through the air and anyone can get it. I am young and as a future mother, want my children to have a bright future. And it's <coughs> critical that this unique moment of having a UN high level meeting on TB is effective to bring change. Communities affected by TB and civil society are at the heart of this drive for change. So put people at the center of the TB response and keep them there so that we can find and link the 40 million people with TB to a health system that provides quality TB care for all. For each country, have clear national targets for testing, treatment, and prevention within your national strategic plan. Prevention includes commitment to prevent TB transmission in workplaces, schools, and other congregant settings by 2020, and also to diagnose and provide preventive therapy to 80 million people, including children. Transform the TB response to be rights-based and people-centered. Each person has the right to know their TB status and be provided with accessible, affordable, and equitable TB care with zero stigma and discrimination. Create a research envi enabling environment to introduce new tools to TB, a two month or less <coughs> oral cure before 2028, affordable point of care diagnostics that can identify new infections and treat for drug resistance by 2025, and commit to rolling out the latest TB medications such as bedaquiline and delaminid ensure availability of gene expert machines in all point of care facilities. Commit to double the funding to 13 billion US dollars annually and triple annual investments with member states increasing investments in line with the fair share of the global um, funding need. <coughs> Address the catastrophic costs that patients are face facing Ensure aids for those suffering hearing loss and deafness due to the TB medication side effects. Nutritional supplementation is needed, as well as psychological and other social support. Our final ask is 
to commit to a decisive and accountable global <coughs> leadership, including an annual progress report, and to convene a follow-up meeting of this UN high-level meeting on TB in 2023. TB-affected communities need a political audience. Let the structure of today's meeting with affected communities part of every panel today be the model of conversations on TB going forward. All heads of state and presidents should attend the high-level meeting on TB in September 2018. We share your passion and we value your commitment to end TB. Thank you. I thank Ms. Truman for her statement. Ladies and gentlemen, as indicated in the program, this interactive civil society hearing consists of an opening segment, four separate panel discussions, and a closing segment, all of which will take place in this room. I'd like to remind the participants that there will be no pre-established list of speakers. Participants are therefore encouraged to use the opportunity during the panel discussions to pose questions and respond in an interactive manner to the comments and presentations made by the panelists and other experts. The interventions from the floor should be limited to two minutes. One minute before the end of, of the time limit, the red light located on the microphone will start blinking. Panel discussion one, entitled Reaching the Unreached, Closing Gaps in TB Diagnosis, Treatment, Care and Prevention, will be moderated by Ms. Joanne Carter, Executive Director of Results and will take place immediately following this opening segment. Panel discussion two, entitled Investing to End the World's Leading Infectious Killer, will be moderated by Ms. Ardi Marti, Executive Director of APCASO, and will take place from 11.45 a.m. to 1 p.m. Panel discussion three, entitled Innovation to End TB, New Tools and Approaches, will be moderated by Mr. Wim van der Velde of the Global Network of People Living with HIV and will take place from 3 p.m. to 4.15 p.m. Panel discussion four, entitled Partnerships for Success, the role of communities in an equitable, person-centered, right-based response, will be moderated by Mr. Ellen Maleche of the Kenya Legal and Ethical Issue Network on HIV and AIDS and will take place from 4.15 p.m. to 5.45 p.m. The closing segment will begin immediately thereafter at 5.45 p.m. I would now like to invite the moderator and the panelists of panel discussion one to take their seats at this podium. The opening segment is now concluded.
If everyone can take your seats, we can go ahead and get started with the first panel. I first want to thank everyone who spoke before, but particularly our colleague from TB Proof for grounding us in the reality of why we are here today and why we need to fight so hard um, to make this moment a success. It's very powerful to see so many civil society and community leaders here today who have fought for so long to end the epidemic of tuberculosis. September of 2018 needs to be the moment when the world unites behind you at the highest levels. I'm Joanne Carter, and I'm also not only the director of results, but also proud to be the vice chair of the Stop TB Partnership. I believe that with tuberculosis, the biggest challenge we face is not scientific or medical, though we have those challenges, it's political. For decades, tuberculosis has been stuck at the bottom of the list of political priorities, and hence it has climbed to the top of the list of infectious killers. That's why this year's high-level meeting is so historic, because finally, we have the chance to mobilize the political leadership needed to solve this political problem. Among our greatest failures in TB is the failure to reach over 40% of the people who get sick with TB every year, 4.3 million missing people. And tens of millions more of the most vulnerable people are not receiving preventive treatment to keep them from getting sick. That's why the first key ask for the high-level meeting is to reach all people to close the gaps in TB diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. And to help us better understand what it'll take to reach everyone, I'm honored to moderate our first panel of experts, which includes Dean Lewis, TB survivor with the Touched by TB Network in India, and also co-chair of the Civil Society Advisory Panel, Dr. Farhana, um, Amanula, who is a pediatrician working in Pakistan and chair of the Child and Adolescent TB Working Group of the Stop TB Partnership. Donald Tobawea, Executive Director, Jointed Hands Welfare Organization in Zimbabwe and also a member of the Civil Society Advisory Panel. Dr. Seya Kato, Director of the Research Institute of Tuberculosis and the Japan Anti-Tuberculosis Association and the Honorable Helen Tan, parliamentarian from the Philippines and co-chair of the Asia-Pacific TB Caucus of Parliamentarians. I want to ask you again to please note that after our panel, there will be the opportunity, we'll open it up for the interactive session. Um, we are going to ask you to keep your um, interventions to two minutes so we can have as many people engaged as possible. And I want to let you know that beginning now, and during our panel, if you wish to be placed in the list of speakers, you can press the button at the base of your microphone to let us know. And representatives from the Secretariat will come around the chamber and get the names of the organization or member state on whose behalf you wish to speak. So starting now, you can let us know. As we prepare for the TB High Level Meeting, I think we need to remember that the question is not whether it's possible to reach everyone. It is. The question is whether we will make it a priority. Who is being left behind in the TB response is no accident. The TB bacterium doesn't discriminate, but too often our systems and policies do. Whether it's those living in poverty, children, migrant workers, marginalized ethnic groups, people in prison, or people uh, isolated by geography or social stigma, it is the most vulnerable groups who are systematically left out from quality treatment. And that's why the target of diagnosing and treating a cumulative 40 million people by the end of 2022, including three and a half million children and a million and a half people with drug-resistant TB is so critical. And why it's so important that the WHO and Stop TB and the Global Fund and the US Agency for International Development have all embraced this. This requires maintaining all the progress already and getting to everyone who is currently being missed. And the target is one that each country can track and own its share. We know the numbers country by country. We actually have those numbers. How many people we're reaching, how many people we're missing, and how many we need to reach before 2023. We now need heads of state to make ambitious commitments and embrace accountability for their share of the target. 
which means working with all partners to do what's needed to reach everyone and committing to track progress at the head of state level. So now to ground us in the reality and the challenges that millions of marginalized people face in accessing care, I'd like to first welcome Dean Lewis to share with us his own experience with TB. Thanks, Dean. Uh, thanks. In 1993, the World Health Assembly declared TB to be a global emergency. In 1993, I was in Delhi living on the streets, sleeping in a graveyard. I had TB. I knew I had TB. I could not get access to medicines. I went to the district TB hospital and they said, no, you have a drug problem, go to the rehabs. I went to the rehabs, they said, no, you have active TB. Go to the TB hospitals. I was stuck for two years. I never got access to treatment. Millions of people like me who live in abject poverty have no access to food or water, who by their behaviors are either criminalized or marginalized, have no access to treatment. We fall through the cracks. There are 12 million of us in India, as per the document that Joanne uh, put up, that need to be given treatment, care, and cured. The things that made me an invisible person were the guidelines, the public health guidelines that did not give medicines to people who did not have identity documents or a residence. The things that made me invisible were the legal system that could not do anything because I belonged to a criminalized population. The things that made me invisible was because people looked through me because I was filthy on the streets and coughed in their faces. So they would look through me. It made me invisible. And there are a huge number of populations that are still invisible to us and to, this, uh, and, and, and to our current health treatment guidelines. The key ask that I am asking for and that we as a community are asking for today is that we find the missing millions, that you commit the funds, that you commit the will, and that you commit yourself. And that is our message to the missions and civil society over here. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Dean. Now we're gonna hear from uh, Dr. Farhana Amanullah about one of the groups most likely to be left behind in our TB efforts children and what we need to do to change that. Thank you, Joanne. I represent children who are at the heart of our fight against TB. I present to you a six-month-old baby who presents with fever and fits brought in by her aunt because her mother died from pulmonary TB and the child is unimmunized. Despite adequate treatment, the child is left with irreversible brain damage and requires services that the family cannot afford. This child represents critical missed opportunities in antenatal care that fail to recognize a pregnant woman with tuberculosis and treat her, in newborn care that fail to recognize a high-risk uh, infant who required TB preventive treatment, in immunization services that fail to provide BCG to this baby, in frontline care, they failed to recognize tuberculosis in this baby until it was too late and it had a devastating outcome. This child and millions of others are victims of tuberculosis, a devastating yet preventable disease. When treated for tuberculosis, children do very well. Yet less than half of the one million children sick with TB each year are ever diagnosed. More than 700 children die of tuberculosis every day. 80% of these are babies under five years of age, and a vast majority have not been given a fighting chance. Of the 40 million people with tuberculosis that we need to find and treat in the upcoming four years, 3.5 million are children under 15 years of age. Every child deserves a safe and healthy childhood. The right to equal access to health is enshrined in several international human rights agreements. 
Tuberculosis is a family condition. It enters the household most likely through an adult or an older child. Young children or those with weakened immune systems are exposed to it. They acquire infection and are highly likely to progress to disease that can be devastating. It can, it can cause mortality. And in many situations is diagnosed late where it results in a crippling lung disease, deformities, irreversible brain damage. I see this all too often in my practice in a large referral center in Pakistan. Uh, and I see doctors struggle to diagnose TB with the current tools that we have. Poor living conditions, HIV co-infection, undernutrition, and a lack of access to basic health care enhance a household's vulnerability to this condition. Families may face catastrophic costs. A, a, a parent that is not able to provide, is barely able to provide food, cannot bring children uh, to facilities that may not be close to home uh, frequently for months on end. This cycle of morbidity, poverty, mortality, and despair, which can perpetuate for generations, can be broken if we take advantage of simple tools like screening, provide prevention, diagnose, and treat children and their families. Where are these missing children? These children are all around us. They are in households of, of families with newly diagnosed tuberculosis. They are among the malnourished. They are children with common childhood illnesses like pneumonia, malnutrition, um, and they may be in HIV clinics uh, or accessing care at the primary care level. Making communities and frontline providers aware of TB risk factors, signs, and symptoms is a first step in breaking this horrid cycle of neglect. What can we do? What must member states commit to at the United Nations high-level meeting? Multi-sectoral action to integrate TB education and screening services into other programs that reach children and families, Ensure that all children and families affected by TB have equitable access to care by mobilizing national and local resources necessary to establish frontline robust care with, where either they can diagnose and treat children at the frontline or link families to care near their home. Invest in research to develop desperately needed child-friendly tools. The current sputum-based diagnostic tools are far too insensitive to, uh, to be effective for children. We need sim simpler, shorter regimens for prevention and treatment of all forms of TB and an effective vaccine. And we need global and national TB targets that are specific to children and adolescents with TB against which we can measure our progress and hold our governments and stakeholders accountable. We need to have we need to reach 3.5 million children in the upcoming years, and we need to provide TB preventive therapy to 9 million children. And we do not even know how many adolescents we have to cater to, probably twice the number of children that we need to reach. So on behalf of the children and families affected by TB, on, a, on behalf of the global community of doctors, researchers, and advocates who have been fighting to end this NTB, I implore to world leaders to commit to actions to end TB in children. Thank you very much. Thank you, Farhana. And now I'd like to invite Donald uh, Tobaiwa to talk about what it will take to reach a number of key populations with very high burdens of tuberculosis that have too often been left behind, minors and prisoners. So please go ahead. Thank you, Joan. Minors' lungs are a playground for TB. And why am I saying this? Silicosis increases the risk of active TB by up to fourfold. And HIV increases the risk approximately fivefold. The combination of silicosis and HIV produces a multiplier effect, increasing the risk of acquiring active TB by 15 times greater than in individuals without silicosis. So minors are at a higher risk. But what are countries doing about this? Especially with the emergence of artisanal and small-scale minors who are not regulated. Prisons, ladies and gentlemen, are a breeding pack for TB. The risk of TB in prison, on average, is 23 times higher than in the general population. 
million people, 10.2 million people, to be precise, are held in prisons at any one time globally, with four to six times this number passing through the world's prisons every year. 33% of prisoners are on remand only, and most prisoners are eventually released back into, this, into the society after breeding TB. And what are countries doing about this? According to the 2016 WHO report, my country, Zimbabwe, is at 81% treatment coverage, which means we miss 6,646 people with TB every year. And between 2018 and 2022, we have to find, test, and treat 110,000 people. South Africa is at 54%, missing 1.4 million people, among so many statistics. This requires country and countries in the global community to take a business unusual approach. In terms of access in the two communities, minors and prisons, the majority of the 40% missed people failed to enter the TB diagnostic pathways due to barriers to access. And these barriers to access include social, attitudes of prison wardens, stigma, patriarchy, mobility, education, awareness. There are also economic barriers, poverty, and availability of diagnostic facilities within prisons and artisanal and small-scale mining communities, drug inavailability, conflicting economic priorities. People can't take time to attend to clinics. Loss of job if I'm uh, diagnosed with TB. And then also infrastructural. The remote point of care, no transport services, migrant populations internally and cross-border, ventilation systems in prisons and ventilation systems in mines, systematic pre uh, 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 screening in prisons and mines remains the major challenge. Diagnostic inefficiencies, and the major being specimen transportation at country level, which means the turnaround time from specimen to treatment initiation takes longer. Treatment completion. The potential consequences of incomplete treatment includes low cure rate, reactivated TB, drug resistance, and continued ineffectiveness. Countries should therefore link treatment completion back to screening programs. Countries should also include community-based screening and adherence support. Countries should strengthen cross-border referral systems because the bacteria knows no borders. It knows no boundaries, especially for mobile populations, including minors, as well as internal migration. So what must be done to find, diagnose all the missed people, especially artisanal and small-scale miners and prisons? We need to strengthen the referral systems. We need to strengthen cross-border referral systems. We need to improve the media profile. TB is an underplayed epidemic, and yet it impacts us all. And I'll give you an example. 18 months ago, 200 people were diagnosed with listeriosis in South Africa and died of listeriosis. Ministers had so many urgent meetings in Southern Africa because of 200 people. But in the same period, 2,400 people died of TB. Another example is 23,000 people died of TB in South Africa alone in 2016, and far more died of TB and HIV. But nothing, there was no hype. Increased decentralized points of care. We need to invest in points of care diagnostic equipment. We need to get to the people. We need integration, collaborative index case and contact tracing. Integrate tuberculosis and HIV. Integrate TB with diabetes. Ensure we manage comorbidities and offer a comprehensive approach. 
An example being within the TB in Minds Global Fund Grant, where we have occupational health service centers that are reaching out to a comprehensive package of people with a comprehensive package of services from audiometry to testing. And lastly, ladies and gentlemen, in Southern Africa alone, there was a declaration for TB in Minds in 2010. And in 2013, there was a code of conduct but only two countries have signed the code of conduct, which means the declaration was not domesticated. So equally, if we sign any declaration in September, and if it's not domesticated, nothing then happens in terms of implementation. In conclusion, the question is not how much it costs to find and treat these missing cases, but how much it costs not to find them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I'll, we're going to hear from Dr. Seiya Kato about Japan's experience in dramatically reducing tuberculosis and reaching nearly everyone and what it took and some of the lessons for today. Thanks. Thank you, Joanna. The TB burden in Japan was so high that the incidence rate of tuberculosis in 1951 was approximately 700 over 100,000 population, which was higher than that of most current high burden countries. Owing to the maximum effort through collaboration among multi sectors based on tuberculosis to tuber prevention law, incidence was reduced approximately 10 percent between 1965 and 1978. I would like to focus on a few items based on my experience. One, how to materialize patient centered TB care and prevention. First of all, a national TB control guideline and related legislation should clearly describe the need for multi sectoral approach and roles of relevant organizations. In our program, health centers have a final responsibility for TB control in their jurisdictional area, while not only medical facility, but also organizations from other sectors, such as schools, workplace, welfare facilities, correctional facilities, community-based organizations, and women's association, work to provide case finding and patient-centered support with consent of the patient. At the field level, it is important to provide training, including basic knowledge of TB, skill for patient support, and human rights as well. This patient-centered multi-sectoral approach leads to effective and efficient allocation of available resources in the area, which I believe is applicable in resource-limited setting. Next, finances implication from our history. What we would like to share with you first is that ample investment to TB control successfully reduced both TB incidence and financial burden of TB in the following decades. During high incidence time, as many tools as available were introduced on a nationwide scale with ensured quality. Overall resource used for these efforts was significant, but it results in a rapid decline of incidence, which implies financial benefit. Medical cost of TB comprised 27% of all medical ex expenditure in 1955, while it reduced, decreased to 3.6% in 1975, almost 90% decline in 20 years. Second, we'd like to emphasize that adequate combination of TB specific fund, uh, which is currently covered by global fund in many countries, and universal health coverage, uh, now being paid by domestic tool is important because it produces synergistic effect for both TB control and health system development. In a history, establishing public health insurance in 1961 increased detection of symptomatic disease by lowering financial barrier to medical consultation. TB specific fund subsidies accelerate participation in private sector in the TB control program, and a checking mechanism for public fund subsidies enforce registration, registration and standardized TB care for patient. This private-public partnership has been functioning very well in Japan. It is also noted that allocation of public fund to TB medical care promoted sound development of health insurance since the TB burden was so heavy in those days that covering all the medical costs for TB by health insurance was difficult. In conclusion, our history suggests that each country needs to consider 
appropriate con con combination of TB specific budget and universal health care coverage budget in order to maximize their synergetic effects in ending TB. As for well child TB, previous speaker has already discussed, I'd like to point out two things. First, we need innovative diagnosis uh, without sputum and uh, uh, children uh, friendly TB treatment by strengthened research and development as child doesn't produce sputum, which is good for exam. Second, in order to highlight child TB issue, the global uh, TB community and each country should discuss setting up indicators for promoting child uh, TB control program. For example, the incidence rate of TB is good for indicator for successful TB control program. Actually, when the TB decline rate of, uh, decline rate of incidence, uh, uh, over, sorry, overall decline rate of incidence of 10% in Japan, that old child was 15 to 30%. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to welcome the Honorable Helen Tan to talk about the key role that parliamentarians can play at the national but also regional and global levels to drive both um, ambition and concrete political action. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. 38 years ago, I had a very sad experience on tuberculosis when my mother was inflicted by this ancient disease. The disease weakened her body, and she cannot do her laundry, which is the only source of her income for the, for the poor family. We almost starved to death because of tuberculosis. But she has survived, and to her I dedicate this continuing fight against tuberculosis and to the millions of people who are still suffering from TB. The burden remains high in the Philippines, where around one million Filipinos are estimated to have tuberculosis. This is despite the considerable progress that has been made through the years. Among Filipinos with symptoms, around 41% take no action, around 40% self-medicate, and only 19% seek medical con consultation. The Philippines is missing more than 80% of presumptive these TB cases. A devolved health services does not help raise political commitment to end tuberculosis, which is at varying degrees, oftentimes it is low and unreliable. It has been my burden to ease the public of the burden of TB. Upon my election, I tried to, uh, I tried to address the gaps in the national TB program through legislation. I believe that a more comprehensive strategy is needed to strengthen the fight against tuberculosis. It was my hope then, as it is my hope now, that the national commitment to end tuberculosis will become more public, resolute, and solemn, and will enable sustainable and programmatic measures to be implemented effectively and efficiently, and that the government uh, policy against uh, tuberculosis will be communicated to the people and ensure or secure active cooperation among various agencies and sectors of the society. The TB law, which I have principally authored, is considered a landmark legislation in the Philippines, and its important features are um, the mandatory notification of TB cases, inclusion of modules on TB control in the curriculum, the expansion of insurance benefits to include the MDRTB, and of course, provision of a sustainable, adequate funding for the national TB programs, research and development, and TB awareness and information dissemination. Through its implementing rules and regulation, we are expecting that the missed cases will be detected, those who lost the follow-ups will be placed to treatment again, Systematic screening of those exposed contacts and high-risk groups will be facilitated, and that facilities and services will be upgraded and expanded with human resource complement, and sensitive and rapid diagnostics and reliable treatments will be available, accessible, and affordable, and most importantly, that the health-seeking behavior of Filipinos will be improved. 
What's good with having a law is that the agencies of the government can be made accountable and it gives us an assurance of a government in action. But the government cannot do it alone. And I think that's the mere reason why we are here today. We need to transcend the bounds of the public, private, and civil society. There has to be a driving force to, material, to materialize the things that we need to do to end TB. That driving force is political commitment, which is more than just the affirmative votes. It is more than just attending TB conventions or hearings like this. And it is more than just declaring that TB has no place in the future. More than anything else, political commitment is about providing an adequate and sustainable funding for TB diagnosis, treatment, care, and prevention. As a legislator, I've realized that parliaments play an indispensable role in TB eradication because um, we are the institutions of the government that can di directly relate to the people as well as the powers that be. Parliaments make possible the building of a formidable war versus tuberculosis since they have the power of the purse and provide oversight in the implementation of TB programs and make those people and uh, concerned agencies accountable to the public. The Global TB Caucus, a group of more than 2,300 parliamentarians from 132 countries, are committed to ending TB and has been instrumental in staging the upcoming high-level TB meeting on September. Having leaders across the world on board in this fight um, somehow gives us confidence that TB can be defeated. I believe that the task of leaving no one behind can be better achieved under the idea that a comprehensive health care must be available to all as a right of citizenship. This ensures that everyone will be embraced in the cause of fighting tuberculosis. We have to realize that a person ill with TB does not only need medical attention. He also needs subsistence support for his family in case he cannot work, <coughs> nutrition for his recovery, and transportation for him to be able to access the point of care. Services at barring points must converge at the doorstep of the TB victim. And I am happy to inform you that this is a work in progress in my country. Ultimately, it is my belief that TB cannot be solved unless we strike at the very heart of poverty, injustice, discrimination, and inequality. We cannot close the gaps unless we are able to provide adequate income, fairness and justice, equity and respect for the inalienable rights of every human person. Together, let us um, make March 24, March 24 not just a day to raise awareness on tuberculosis, but a joyous celebration because finally, we, will, we are able to end tuberculosis. Thank you very much and good morning. Thank you so much and thanks to all the panelists. And the last one was a great reminder of the power of civil society and communities working with parliamentarians, what's possible. So in a moment, I'm going to open the floor for the interactive discussion and we'll call on participants to make interventions. When I announce your organization or member state name to speak, if you could just please press the microphone um, so that we can see the green light and that will allow the technician to activate your microphone. When the light turns red, that means you can proceed to your intervention. <clears throat> I'm, I'll let you know that we're going to start with Egypt, then the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent, and then Peru, and then we'll keep going down as many as we can. Again, I'm gonna ask you to, uh, to limit your interventions to two minutes in order to allow for more participation. And your microphone will start blinking when you have one minute left to wrap up, and then the color will go solid again um, to let you know to conclude your interventions. And I will say, because we only have about 20 to 25 minutes, we won't be able to get to everyone in this session, but we'll get to as many as we can. So again, I'll now I'll start the floor with um, Egypt, 
then the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent, and then Peru. Thank you, uh, Madam Moderator, and thank you for all the panelists uh, for coming here uh, in New York. For uh, Thank you for sharing your stories. These are your stories, but also stories of millions of people, uh, stories of stigma, of vulnerability, of social determinants related to poverty and uh, other uh, situations uh, which make people more vulnerable to, to TB. And thank you as well for, for, for sharing some thoughts and recommendations as for how to really, uh, for the international community to be up to the challenge and to make sure that we really bring about the international response that is needed to end TB by, by 2030. I'll be uh, a very short, uh, uh, I come from Egypt, which is also honored to uh, uh, chair the, the group of 77 in China in, in the UN which is the largest group of developing nations. We have been very active in the discussions for the preparations for the high-level meeting, wanting to make sure that it happens at the highest possible level, that there is bold and strong commitment. And we really thank you for coming here, for sharing your stories, for sharing your experiences, but also for telling us what we ought to do, because we think that this is very important to inform us in the discussions we will have in the time ahead. Tomorrow and in the days ahead, in uh, the consultations to, to have an, a strong and a bold outcome document for the high-level meeting on September 26. And we must all make sure that really nobody is left behind. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your work on this and for your support. Thanks. Um, and now the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent. Thank you, moderator, for giving me the floor. I am Jose Maria Di Bello. I'm director on health care for the Argentinian Red Cross. 23 years ago, I've been living with HIV, and some years ago, I had to be treated by extra, for extra pulmonary TB. But therefore, personally speaking, this meeting is very meaningful. But today, I'm not only talking to you from the strength of my experience, but on behalf of the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent. It's 190 members and many, many volunteers. Many of those are involved in health care programs and work with their governments to deal with many priorities involving public health. The speakers have already spoken at length in the lost cases of TB. The epidemic of TB cannot be tackled if we do not reach the people who have disappeared with TB. We must diagnose them treat them and notify them. It is therefore fundamental for us not only to have universal health coverage, but also we must have access to health for everyone, which includes people affected by prolonged emergency situations and other high-risk situations. We believe that some 200 million individuals are living in countries affected by disasters and conflicts. So I have a question. The control of TB activities in complicated environments are still not taken care of. There are no adequate guidelines to deal with TB in complex emergency situations. There is no appropriate coordination mechanism to tackle this matter even though there are good practices. How then are we planning to decrease the number of lost cases without tackling prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of TB in humanitarian contexts? Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Peru and then Mimo Mozambique and the Russian Society of TB Specialists. Muchas gracias. Thank you, moderator. Peru is 
very aware of the importance of strengthening dialogue with civil society, and we're happy that they are here, as well as the private sector, in order more effectively to tackle TB. TB, above and beyond a problem of public health, is also an obst obstacle to economic and social development of societies, and we cannot forget the stigma represented by this disease against which we must also fight. Peru is aware of this reality. It is one of the countries with the largest incidence of TB in the world. My country is thus firmly committed to fight TB together with target 3.3 of the Sustainable Development Goals and the three pillars contained in the strategy of WHO putting an end to TB by means of attention and prevention, which is patient-centered and bold policies for the patient during the treatment. For instance, the PAN-TV basket and in engaging in innovation in the TB laws in my country, we've been implementing a multi-sectoral plan of the response to TB 2010-2019 in a cross-cutting fashion among all sectors. Along this line, since this is a most important issue to be treated at the state level, we'd like to stress also the important work done by the Congress of our Republic, and we join forces with them at the national level. And in a follow-up to the first World Conference in Moscow, Peru is preparing to participate in the high-level UN meeting on fighting TB, which will take place in this city in some three months' time. Let me conclude by reaffirming Peru's commitment to fight the numbers of TB patients, to treat the disease, and to adopt a specific and robust political declaration at the high-level meeting. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you so much for Peru's leadership in this area. Um, so next, we'll hear from Amimo Mozambique and then the Russian Society of TB Specialists. Thank you very much. My name is Moises Wamusi, a former mine worker from Mozambique. I am a member of Mozambique and Mine Workers Association, and I represent ex-mine workers in the Global Funding Regional Grant for TB in the mining sector in Southern Africa. When mine workers are affected by the TB, and kept in mine hospitals for treatment, they are sent home without full medical record to easy continued treatment. That means there is no information sharing between mine private hospitals and public health service. This practice affects the cross-border referral system, which now count on 4% miners dying per year on treatment. This has been stressed in the lawsuit on TB and silicosis settled by this, the Supreme Court in South Africa against the mining industry. So far, regional efforts have been made that resulted in approving and signing of harmonized and treatment uh, of TB among some countries, including signing the SADC declaration on TB in the mining sector. But because the referral system is not in place, we still die as if nothing has been agreed. Now, my question to the hearing is, what is the cost of gathering and signing instruments that are not implemented than losing lives of people due to lack of political will. How can we avoid singing like broken records on ending TB without acting accordingly? As mine workers and affected populations, we say 
Nothing for us without us on ending TB in September health in September. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you very much and for that powerful and important reminder as well. Now the Russian Society of TB Specialists and then the International Commission on Occupational Health. Just let's start out. Can you just start over now? Your microphone is on. Uh. Colleagues, I am a representative of one of the 85 uh, regions of Russia, Voronezh, where 2.5 million people live. Over the past 10 years, TB infections have decreased by more than 300%. Tuberculosis needs to be fought against, and we know how to do so, and we can share our successful experience. What were the key factors for our success? Cooperation since 2009 with international World Health Organization partners. Together, we found new priority goals, which are prevention and early diagnosis of TB, strict infection control, and maintaining this uh, outside of hospitals. We have also worked into joint infection control platforms. We regularly screen for tuberculosis where we uh, identify those in Varonezh and the region, leading to identifying many more cases of TB over the past six years. We have increased this by six times. In 2018, we have decreased the cases to 100. We are identifying these cases at an early stage, and we have been told that we are spending too much on preventative care and early checkups, but on our experience, we have seen that our approach is both effective and financially viable, which allows to truly protect the lives of the young working age population, which unfortunately are those most likely to be affected by TB. At the state level, there must be legislation put into place to carry out wide ranging preventative care measures for the early diagnosis of TB. We have clearly shown this in Varonezh region. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then next we'll hear from the International Commission on Occupational Health and then the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Health workers comprise the largest global workforce and are found in every country. Worldwide, there are 60 million healthcare workers. At the same time, there's a shortage of more than 7 million health workers. This shortage is expected to increase to 13 million by 2035. There are several reasons for the healthcare worker shortage, but a major factor is contracting a debilitating chronic or fatal disease, or even just the fear of this happening. Health healthcare facilities are dangerous workplaces. The risk of acquiring tuberculosis is two to four times the general population, depending on whether you're in a country with a low or a high burden of TB. We cannot ask people to be healthcare workers without trying to ensure their health and safety. There are several preventive measures that can be utilized in healthcare facilities that can prevent the healthcare worker from becoming infected with tuberculosis. These preventive measures such as respirators, appropriate ventilation, efficient identification and triaging of tuberculosis-infected patients have all been shown to be effective. There is some cost involved in implementing these measures, but the cost is far less than treating someone who has become infected, both in actual cost of treatment and also in loss in the individual's health, his ability to earn an income, uh, the loss of the family, the ability to care for his or her family, and the loss to the community of the healthcare workforce. Health workers are valuable assets. 
all countries need to have legislation and provide financial resources to protect the health and safety of their health care workers. And this should be in the UN Declaration in September. If we don't take care of our health care workers, there will not be enough health care workers to take care of us. Thank you. Thanks very much for that important reminder about those um, often most at risk and on the, and on the front lines. Next, the uh, Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. Uh, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen and esteemed colleagues, I would like to use my time to emphasize the need for a global target on preventive therapy for children in addition to targets on pediatric treatment and diagnosis. When children are exposed to a person with TB, the use of child-friendly fixed-dose combinations, which are highly effective and available at low cost, can prevent development of TB disease. Yet in 2016, only 13% of the 1.3 million eligible children accessed IPT. TB is a terrible disease for everyone, but as we heard from Dr. Amanula, is particularly heinous in children. Uh, TB infection in children is more likely to progress to active TB. Children have higher case vitality from TB infection. And even when children survive severe TB, they often go on to experience lifelong developmental and physical challenges. Children with HIV have even more restricted treatment options, and HIV-TB co-infected children experience an increased mortality risk even when receiving TB treatment. Yet again and again, we fail to provide TB preventive therapy for at-risk children. We must take this opportunity to send a clear message that preventive therapy is a critical part of fighting childhood TB, and that we will not sit passively while our children are ravaged by a preventable disease. We need governments to commit to providing preventive therapy to 90% of children with household exposure to TB, with particular attention given to children under age five and children of all ages living with HIV. Thank you. And yes, and thanks for um, emphasizing that. And we have to remember this is about finding and treating those that are sick with TB, but also the opportunity of a bold target of preventing uh, TB by preventive treatment of 80 million people, including children. Um, next, I'd like to um, ask the uh, Indian Medical Association, and then we'll see. Yes, go ahead. Good morning, His Excellency and the August Gathering. I, President of the Indian Medical Association, a 300,000 organization of modern medicine doctors with more than 2,000 branches. We are well aware that out of the 4.1 million cases missing globally, 1 million is from India. Studies have shown that almost all of these missing cases are in private sector. Substantial number of these patients had consulted a private doctor, mostly their family physician, at some stage. The private modern medicine doctor still remains a weak link in this chain, strengthening this link of a private doctor to the national program is the need of our. IMA with adequate resources, including human resources from the program, are determined to account and care for the missing million in India. Our Honorable Prime Minister has already committed himself in acquiring the SDG 3 right in 2025. And the Indian Medical Association has partnered with the government of India for an extensive NTB program. But we require more funds and resources for the public-private partnership. To end, I would like to thank my previous speaker on occupational health, where in India we are finding that our junior doctors and medical students are very, very vulnerable, and there are increasing incidences of drug-resistant tuberculosis amongst our junior doctors. Thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you very much for those important comments. Um, now, uh, Management Sciences for Health, MSH, and then we should have time for one more.
Okay, thank you. Um, my focus is on urban TV. Um, all what we're talking, the high-risk groups, the high-risk population, most are located in urban areas. Take it uh, HIV, AIDS, diabetic mellitus, silicosis, and all. Uh, most of you know, the high-risk groups are in urban. The urban TV constantly is showing high in WHO uh, surveys across the world. And urban population is growing fast, especially in Africa and Asia where the uh, TV burden is uh, high. Uh, in urban, the poverty is high, uh, the internal migration is high, and the internally migrated people usually, they don't have uh, good housing um, and good uh, supplies, and even they don't have an access for the available healthcare service because they don't have proper registration. All these factors and uh, the underlying in Africa, the underlying HIV, which is high in urban, and diabetics, which is high in urban also, all this favors, you know, to uh, um, design an urban-focused um, TV strategies uh, in Africa and Asia, because what all the high-risk groups are also located in the urban, and with uh, increasing um, in urban population in the coming decade, uh, the problem will be more significant. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very important reminder. Um, given where we are on time, I'm actually going to now turn back. So I apologize we didn't get to everyone who was on this list. Um, uh, there will be three other panels and opportunities for further interventions. I'm going to turn back to our panel. There's no way that they are going to be able to answer all the questions or all the issues raised, but I, I invite them to um, respond as they see appropriate to some of the things that were said or just share some final comments in um, two minutes or less. So Dean, we'll start with you, just some final reflections or responses. Thank you for those uh, interventions and thank you for the commitments that the missions made. I just want to point out one more thing about that 1993 World Health Assembly. They also called for the formation of a joint UN program on AIDS, and that's how UN AIDS was formed. So it's exactly 25 years. On one hand, we had UN AIDS with the political will, we had HIV, with political will, with resources, with funding. And on the other hand, we had TB, which is just a global emergency. And we need to look at why UN AIDS is where it is, why the response to HIV is what it is. And as Eric Gooseby pointed out, it is because of the involvement of civil society and the, and the push for rights-based treatment. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much, Dean. Um, Farhana. Uh, thank you. So I really appreciate uh, the comments from uh, ECPAF about um, preventive therapy in children, which is absolutely um, the one area that we are majorly lagging behind. As uh, she mentioned, that we currently reach less than 13% of children who are eligible for uh, preventive therapy, um, and uh, so massive scale up of preventive therapy is a big uh, is, is one of the messages that we really want to bring out uh, and inform uh, countries uh, is a way of uh, moving forward for uh, for children with tuberculosis, and um, uh, and of course uh, child specific targets is uh, the next important thing that we, we absolutely need um, a, a, in order to know how we are doing in our, uh, uh, in our progress uh, towards ending um, TB in children as well as in adolescents. Um, I think that is all from me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Donald, please. Yeah. And we'll thank all of our panelists at the end. Thank you, Donald. Thank you. Um, for me, the declaration uh, in September must be linked to policy reforms, domestic financing, and non-biomedicalization, and I'll repeat that, non-biomedicalization of TB to ensure that we find the mis missing people in prisons, 
as well as in mines. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then uh, Seiya, please, yes. Dr. Kada. Uh, there was a question on the TB control in the, in the, under the condition of disaster uh, situation. Japan has experienced two big earthquakes in, in, in the past 20 years. Uh, we was rather carefree what's going on, what's, what will happen with the TB, with TB incidents, but there's no uh, apparent increase of TB incidents in these two events. Maybe it depends on the basic health infrastructure which is very essential, and the so-called resilience of health system, which supports the TB control as well. So in conclusion, as I mentioned, the, of course the, the TB control effort is very important, but at the same time, it's highly connected to the, to the, to the establishment of USC. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Mm, and Helen, please. Thank you, Joanne. Um, thank you for the commitment of uh, the missions and the inputs from the civil society. I think we have to realize that no matter how good the policies and programs and how much the fund we infuse, there will always be a lot of challenges uh, in uh, dealing with this problem. And I think what matters most is that each country should um, contribute their share of actions to us address this problem and that the civil society uh, organization should not uh, stop on making noise on September 26, but we need to be consistent on uh, calling uh, our leaders and all stakeholders to uh, take actions until we reach our goal on ending tuberculosis. That's all, thank you. Um, well, I just wanna say that our panelists have been so um, uh, efficient. I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to give you one more moment and say if there is one thing that you would want to say to heads of state. So I'm just going to give you a, a very last comment, and then, I'm gonna, and then I will close the panel. So just um, one thing that you would want to say to heads of state and government um, uh, that will be coming to the high-level meeting in September. One thing we have, like an ask, we have a, we have, we, we have a 35 page <laughs> list of asks. <laughs> but, but yeah, but the one thing that I would want to say to the heads of government, first of all, be present at the high level meeting, because if you're not there, then it's like a pretty useless meeting, as Luchika said. Yeah? Uh, so be there, commit, commit to finding the burden. Of, of, well, I can't call it a burden. We are, we are not burdens, we are people. <laughs> Commit to finding the missing millions. India, not one million missing, 12 million missing. Yeah, we have a whole list. Each government needs to commit to find that, yeah? Commit to buying a little less uh, of other stuff and invest in TB. Invest in services, invest in R&D, invest in a bloody vaccine, oops. <laughs> Farhani, you've, you've said it powerfully before, but let's give us a closing. Um, so uh, I think for, for countries, it would be raising the profile of children in their, in their national strategic plans and integrating uh, TB across the board in, um, in all services offered to families and, and children. Uh, and uh, of course, th there are you know, th there's so much research that still needs to be done. Children need to be included early in research. And, um, and I think for countries specifically, uh, it, it, you know, raise, raise funding locally and nationally. It is doable. We are doing it in Pakistan. It can be done. Uh, so I think these are the messages that I would like to give uh, countries. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Donald, one final thought. For me, uh, the heads of states, when they come in and sign the declaration, they must look at our missing people, not as projects, but people that require action. So the declaration must be linked to action. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Dr. Kato, please. 
So the importance of uh, political commitment is, is uh, repeatedly uh, mentioned. And uh, I, I want to emphasize the uh, importance of registration for TB control. And I, one of us, our researchers have a chance to scrutinize minutes of Congress in Japan when uh, our incidence was very high. So he discovered so many types discussed in the, in the Congress on TB control, even in the technical details of, of that. I think it uh, showed the, the political commitment of TB in those days. That's, as I believe, background why we are successfully control TB control. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, Helen. Thank you, Joanne. I think uh, what I want to say to the head of state, uh, as early as now, is for them to open their eyes, open their ears, and their heart, because once you are able to see, to hear, and feel the sufferings of the patients who are, uh, are the uh, sufferings of our TB patients, then uh, we don't have to tell them what to do. They will know uh, how to address this problem. Thank you. Um, so, uh, in, in conclusion, I guess I want to say that first, just that um, we're grateful for all the leaders, not just on this panel who've spoken, but all the leaders in this room and many more around the world who have been the leading edge of the fight to try to reach everyone with TB. And now is the moment when we need the political backing to make that possible. You know, we know that you've heard it. I mean, you've heard it from the panel, but then you've heard it from the room. The people that are most vulnerable to getting sick with TB who are being left behind. We know what it will take to reach them both technically and politically. And again, I want to say again, you've heard it from the room. You've heard it from the panelists. We actually have the data, the power of this target of reaching 40 million missing people by the end of 2022 is we know exactly where those people are, country by country and almost district by district. And so the power of this moment is having heads of state commit to ensuring quality diagnosis and treatment of their share of those 40 million people by the end of 2022. Again, including three and a half million children, a million and a half people with drug resistant TB, and also scaling up ambitiously on preventive therapy to 80 million people, the most vulnerable, most likely to get sick with TB. And what we heard, I think, in this room was that closing these gaps is not only going to require resources, um, it's also going to require ambition, and it's going to hinge on our willingness to put equity, human rights, and a patient-centered approach at the center of our efforts. Civil society and communities have been leading on this, many in this room, leading the way, and we need the international community to rally behind them. And we need heads of state to commit to investing the resources and the political capital to reach their share of the targets, again, with quality diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. We also need donors, and you're going to hear about this in later panels, to make their fo this their focus and put it back, <clears throat> back it up with increased resources and to support for country ambition and also support for the R&D we need um, to make it possible to diagnose and treat even faster and easier um, so that everybody um, can be reached. And as civil society communities, health workers, parliamentarians, technical agencies, scientists, and more, we have to continue the fight for the investment, the policies, the research, and, our, and development that makes this possible. This is absolutely doable, but only if we make it a priority. And I think I want to end with um, Dr. Tedros's call to action, which was that um, for this key moment on uh, um, September 26th, we should aim to get 100 heads of state to the high-level meeting. So thanks, everyone, for all that you are doing to reach and treat everyone. Um, and we look forward to working with you to make the high-level meeting a success and then to reach the people that we are missing today. Thanks very much. Now we're going to invite uh, panel number two to come to the front of the room.
good morning, everyone. If we could all come to our seats, we'll be starting the second panel. This panel runs up to 1 p.m. and we're standing between you and your lunch and um, hopefully we're able to start soon. My name is Ardi Marte. I'm a rights activist from the Philippines and I'm the executive director of an Asia-Pacific regional civil society network on health and human rights called the CASO. And we are the host and co-convenor of the Activist Coalition on TB in Asia-Pacific or ACT Asia-Pacific. I'm moderating panel two um, which is on investing to end the world's leading infectious killer. For the longest time, the TB world has been timid to ask for new tools for scaling up of responses because of lack of money, or so we have convinced ourselves. We have been immobilized because of the fear of the lack of money for TB, TB not only now, but for the longer term, or even for the next three years. If we are ser serious about ending TB, and we know that it is possible to accomplish in this lifetime, we have to somehow get out of the TB financing rut. We need governments to exercise political will so that our TB intervention and research and development needs dictate resources made available for TB and not the other way around. What is the funding landscape for TB? I'll just be giving a few key facts and figures. Available funding for TB implementation is 6.9 billion US dollars in 2017. Where is this money from? 85% of this was resourced domestically and 15% from international funding. So that's good. 80% of all international funding for TB is from the Global Fund and majority of the rest of international funding is in the form of bilateral aid from the US government. What is the funding need and what is the gap? It is USD 65 billion over the five year period of 2016 to 2020. For implementation, this translates to 13 billion US dollars needed per year. The gap is about half of the need or 6.5 billion per year. For R&D, the gap that we need to close is 1.3 billion US dollars per year. Now, compare this to what our governments, to what governments of the world spend on war and militarization. 1.7 trillion US dollars just in 2017. Again, let's note that the total funding need for TB until 2020 is 65 billion US dollars. Our governments have spent 1.7 trillion US dollars just in 2017 on militarization. And so we have to challenge and reject the myth of scarcity of resources. There are enough resources in the world where there is scarcity at the moment and which we have to address is political will to mobilize the resources for TB. Clearly, money for TB is needed and the world has money. We have two calls in this hearing and for the TB high level meeting for governments both donors and implementing countries. One, meet the USD 13 billion needs per year to implement TB care and prevention activities. And we additionally call for at least 3% 3 3 of this to be earmarked for community-led and based approaches, including civil society mobilization, advocacy, and human rights and gender TB work. Second is to increase funding for TB research and development to close the 1.3 billion US dollar annual funding gap. With this introductory frame, I have the honor to now introduce the speakers of this panel. Our panel storyteller is Melchiades Voya Ore, who is an MDTB survivor from the Strongheart Group and is the subject of the award-winning film, Bending the Ark. Um, the first speaker is Dr. Ejo Tavora of Reda TB. Ejo is a researcher on health policies at the Brazilian TB Research Network, a person living with TB for over 30 years and also a TB survivor. The second speaker is Maraike Winrooks. 
Chief of Staff of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, and I am happy to personally note, champion of community and civil society and rights and gender issues. Our third speaker is Carol Kachenga, a civil society advocate from Zambia, executive director of CITAM Plus, member of Action and African, African Coalition on TB. She has lived with HIV for more than 15 years and is a TV survivor and advocate and activist. Last but not least, we have Honorable Nick Herbert, UK Member of Parliament and Co-Chair of the Global TB Caucus. Before we begin with the panelists, I have two important announcements to make. One is about information on the lunch break. So from 1.15 to 2.45, there will be a side event that's organized by UNAIDS on the topic of integrated community approaches to ending TB and HIV epidemics. Um, the venue is the Express Bar on the third floor. There would be secretariat staff at the exit area who could be ushering you to this event, and everybody is cordially invited. The second announcement is about the interactive discussion which will take place after all the panelists have spoken. So following the format of the first panel, beginning from now until the second speaker of this panel, um, we are kindly requesting anybody from the audience who would like to make an intervention to press that small gray silver button at the bottom of your mic um, so that you could be added to the queue of um, floor interventions from the audience. Representatives of the Secretariat would walk around the chamber to ascertain the names of the organization or of the member states on behalf of which the participants would wish to speak. And as, as um, practiced earlier, we wish to inform everyone that a two minutes maximum will be given for per floor intervention. Um, now, I think it's enough with the intros and also the announcements. Let's go right with the panel, um, Melquiades, you have the floor, and Melquiades will be speaking in Spanish, so we request everyone to please make use of the headsets. Thank you. Hola. Hi. Thank you very much, R.D. Martes. I am Melquiades Huaya Ore. I've traveled from my humble neighborhood in the hills of Lima, Peru, to tell you that we can end TB, but only if we invest in better medicines, nutritional support as part of the treatment, and community health workers. But the main one here is hope. You see me now healthy and strong, but I used to be someone who was about to die from multi-drug resistant TB. For many years of my life, I was skin and bones, bedridden, and in so much pain from taking these toxic drugs that I wanted to give up and die. For 10 months, I was in hospital, vomiting blood. And yet I had plans for the future, but had to forget those dreams of mine. The financial burden of my illness forced my parents to choose between paying for my medication or paying for my siblings' schooling. It made my dad often wonder how am I going to pay for food for my wife and children? With more money for TB programs, my siblings could have continued their studies on a regular basis. My dad wouldn't have had to make those difficult decisions. Often, while I was sick, my family cooked and sold food plates on the street to help pay for the medical equipment and the medicine I needed. For many weeks, four of them carried me on a blanket up and down the steep stairs of the hills where I live so I could continue my treatment at the health center and stay alive. We were very lucky. 
when a community health worker brought my medicine directly to my house, I had support to pay for surgery to remove one of my lungs that was full of holes, bacteria, and fungus. It is because of this support and investment that I am here today speaking to you at the United Nations on behalf of millions of people with TB and helping, helping to change life. It is possible to end this disease. Our effort and investment matter. I say to you, leaders of our countries, that we have an opportunity to invest in our future by investing in these support systems for people with TB, their families, and our communities. With more resources, millions of people like myself are suffering today. They could be healthy and strong and achieve their dreams as I am doing now. I'd like to th thank you for believing that our lives are worth of this investment and urgent action. Muchas gracias, Melquiades. Thank you very much, Melquiades. To set the tone for this panel and also the rest of the um, high uh, of the hearing um, to remind us and to ground us on the realities of the work that we're doing uh, and, and that uh, the role that we have, the burden that we have in terms of making sure that we have as strong as possible commitment at the high level meeting. It affects the lives of people affected by the disease. It's a matter of life and death. And the resource that we make or, or don't make could mean the difference between not just life, on, li life and death, but mean a life that is with dignity and productive or those that is with not. Um, and with that, we go to um, the first panelist, um, Dr. Ezio, who would talk about the BRICS experience in terms of the BRICS countries financing their own response. Thank uh, you. Thank you, uh, Madam Moderator, Excellencies. Well, this is a unique opportunity for the member states to change the game against tuberculosis. The group of 77 plus China have the chance to play a key role in this negotiation but we urge for the global leadership by the BRICS. The five BRICS countries have roughly 40% of the global population, 50% of the TB burden, and 60% of the MDR TB burden. If these five countries guarantee the need, needed resources to fill the funding gap for programs, services, and research, we have a great part of the work done, and they can. According to the estimates by WHO, annually there are roughly one and a half million people missing diagnosis and treatment among those five countries. They can do better, and they have all the means and declared political will to do so. BRICS countries spend in their TB programs and services from their own resources almost twice as much as the amount of all international funding to, to the global fight against tuberculosis. This is a result of compromise with universal access by some of these countries. Thus, BRICS can bridge this gap and go beyond supporting other developing countries and it can and need to be done now. To achieve the goals to end TB, we need to double the current funding to 13 billion US dollars annually. It is possible and feasible. This is the only way to guarantee the universal access, uh, universal health coverage for TB care and prevention globally. And for that, we urge member states to agree in a with clear indicators and funding targets. 20B, new and better tools are urgently needed. New diagnostic methods, new treatments, new guidelines. Therefore, research is key. The research and development funding gap is currently by 1.3 billion US dollars. Again, it's the opportunity for the BRICS 
to step ahead. During the Moscow Ministerial Declaration a meeting in, on TB uh, last November, President Vladimir Putin highlighted a compromise by Russia to support and boost the BRICS TB research network, where Brazil is working close to the other BRICS countries. Brazil has guaranteed the first seed money to fund the BRICS TB research network, but we need to speed up the process. Last week in Jishu, China, TB researchers were discussing cooperation and opportunities among BRICS researchers. Brazil has defined its research agenda and its research priorities. Without identifying the gaps and establishing the priorities, there will be not significant research and we will not have developed the tools we need. Each country has to establish its own research agenda. Countries' investments have to go beyond health. When we think of the funding gaps, we think on health. To end TB investment by other sectors is fundamentally needed in welfare, in housing, in justice. An urgent and huge work is to be done. It is time to do more. If the TB declaration for the high-level meeting does not establish clear targets and agreed indicators, we will not end TB by 2030. We need to double our investments now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ezio. I think it's very clear the call for governments to take up leadership for their own responses and as much as possible also for demonstrating global solidarity in the areas of financing, including for research and development. Now we go to Marike, um, who will speak from the Global Fund perspective and provide some in insights related to scaling up, sustaining and scaling up TB responses, um, including funding for enabling environment that includes um, community rights and gender issues. Marike, you have the floor. Thank you very much, RD. <clears throat> Last year, and RD mentioned it already, the Global Fund accounted for two-thirds of international donor funding for TB. Between 2002 and 2018, we have invested more than six billion in TB programs in over 100 countries. And over 17.4 million people received TB treatment. The number of people treated for multidrug resistant forms of TB through global fund supported programs increased to 373,000, a 50 fold increase since 2005. However, the TB response is heavily dependent on domestic investments. With 85% US 5.8 billion last year coming from domestic resources. In low income countries, international donor funding remains critical, accounting for 56% of TB funding. It is clear if we are to achieve our financial targets, most of the funding will have to come from domestic investments. And Asia just uh, made clear that many countries can and do, uh, can and should do more. The Global Fund works extensively with countries to increase domestic investment in TB. Our co-financing requirements are an effective way to stimulate domestic investments. To date, countries have committed an additional $6 billion in health for the 2015-2017 cycle compared to 2012-2014, which represents a 41% increase in domestic funding for health. Ending TB as an epidemic can only be achieved through constant efforts to increase funding, improve efficiency, and reduce barriers to access to ensure that no one is left behind. Communities are essential. They play, play a crucial role in the design of effective interventions, the implementation and evaluation of health services, and the creation of demand for healthcare. And their support is essential to fight stigma and to reach those who do not always go to the clinic in particular the most vulnerable and marginalized populations. Alongside support to the formal health sector, the Global Fund has long supported civil society and community responses to TB, encouraging countries to tackle the issues bottom up by working, with, working in, through, and with communities. We invest in supporting volunteers to raise awareness, fight stigma, and improve access to TB health services, treatment, and care. 
by supporting community health workers who knock on doors and support community members through treatment, the Global Fund is working with local health workers across the world to prevent people from getting drug-resistant TB and to treat those already affected by the disease. The Global Fund also works to include TB prevention and treatment programs through community service delivery points that provide a range of health services. The aim is to address an individual's multiple health needs across different points in their lives, improving overall health outcomes, and resulting in a more uh, cost-effective and efficient approach. Tremendous progress has, to has been made in recent years in our collective response to DB. However, much more needs to be done. Additional resources, including from domestic funding, are needed and key interventions must be prioritized to sustain the gains, bend the curve, and ultimately achieve the global targets of ending TB and achieving universal health coverage. Next year, world leaders will come together under the leadership of France to, as host for the sixth replenishment of the Global Fund. A successful out outcome is critical to sustain progress and expand programs to save lives. I would like to acknowledge the role of President Macron and champion our efforts and hope that he and many other heads of state will be with us in September for the high-level meeting to stop uh, on TB. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marike. And I think it's good to also alert everyone about the Global Fund Replenishment just being around the corner. Demonstration of our country's political will to NTB includes demonstration of a fully funded Global Fund, which has in its highest level of decision making among its uh, vote, both voting board, mem board members, representatives of those who are living or affected with the three diseases, including, um, uh, including um, of tuberculosis. Um, yeah, so now we go to the third panelist, Carol Kachenga, who would share civil society perspective on domestic financing, shared responsibility, and some issues of, uh, around funding absorption based on country experiences. Um, go ahead, Carol. Thank you, Ardi. Um, having had TBHIV co-infection myself, I have experienced firsthand the good and the bad systems uh, with regards to access to treatment, care, and support for both diseases. Many people are being missed by the current uh, diagnosis, uh, the, by the current system for TB diagnosis and treatment. And for those who are diagnosed, too much of the financial burden to get better falls on the patient and their families. For those of us from uh, TB high burden countries, I would like us to call on our governments to take a leading role in financing TB treatment and ultimately a cure for both the disease as well as addressing the conditions that generate it. As countries, we are in a global village and as a global family, we have shared responsibility. TB does not respect borders. The donor community should come to the table to provide assistance that builds the capacity of our, of our countries and our own national governments must increase domestic uh, um, uh, allocation to health. In order for us to end TB as a threat to public health, our governments with the help of civil society and the private sector must ensure availability of existing and new medications. Nutritional support for the people taking those medications Full uh, psychosocial support, particularly for people with multi-drug resistant TB, and accessibility to AIDS for clients with disabilities such as deafness due to TB treatments, and also oxygen uh, concentrator machines for those whose lungs have been affected by multi-drug resistant TB. Community, worker, community health workers will be critically needed to expand access to these services. The declaration of commitments to be agreed upon at the UN High Level Meeting on, uh, on TB in September must include a clear commitment to increase investment in training, supporting, and remunerating of community healthcare workers. We cannot continue conducting business as usual. So what are the, some of the key steps to national health financing? At budget level, national government needs to take steps to increase budget allocation to health but more specifically to the national TB programs. At micro level, we need to take steps to improve uh, uh, tax uh, revenue collection so that there is more budget space overall. New taxes could also help, uh, for example, a tax on tobacco. 
would help reduce smoking and greatly increase the chance, which would uh, greatly uh, uh, increase the chance of TB, while at the same time generate some resources for health if properly um, implemented. Governments also need to continue co-financing for uh, of donor funded programs, but also at the same time, improve absorption of donor funds and budget ex execution, regardless of the funding source. Uh, at the policy level, uh, and programmatic level, we must all take steps to ensure that there are adequate resources for closing the uh, knowledge gap on TB, community mobilization, treatment literacy, and advocacy. To conclude, I'd like to uh, share a few remarks on an encouraging story about how in Zambia we took steps to help and work with the government. My organization, Sitam Plus, is an organization made up of people directly impacted by TB and HIV. Over the years, we've built very close relationships with the government, and during the last replenishment, we, we worked very closely with the government and the civil society, which led to uh, my country, Zambia, pledging for the first time $5 million to the Global Fund. And this now signaling support from a high burden countries. Other countries also like Kenya and Togo also uh, uh, did the same. And a quick example again is for our colleagues from Kenya who worked with the uh, uh, TB caucus to advocate for increased uh, TB resources. The efforts which realized an increase of uh, US dollar three million, which again, the funds were, were, were used to improve the TB response. But this was work between civil society and their government and their, their, their MPs in the TB caucus. This needs to happen everywhere if we are going to end TB by 2030. We are counting on you, the UN member states, to produce a declaration of commitment that reflects the reality we are facing and commitments of the resources needed. I would like to close with a quote from uh, Dr. Dennis Waitley, an American writer, who says, there are two primary choices in life, to accept conditions as they exist or accept responsibility for changing them. Which one will we choose? Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. And now we move, um, last but not the least, to the uh, fourth panelist, um, Honorable Nick Herbert, who I hope would provide us with some words of hope, <laughs> um, words on uh, that would rally support and championing from fellow um, duty bearers, um, especially around accountability and the role of government representatives. Um, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. It's a great honor to be able to join this important event at the United Nations. We're all looking forward to the 26th of September and the high-level meeting at the United Nations. It's an incredibly important opportunity. But there's a simple truth, which is that political declarations don't treat patients. Words are not enough. TB was, after all, declared a global health emergency 25 years ago. Since then, 50 million people have lost their lives. And it is a fine thing that the uh, United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals, agreed by all the world's leaders just a very few years ago, specifically says in Goal 3.3 that these epidemics will be beaten in 15 years' time. But as we've heard at the current rate of progress, uh, TB will not be beaten for uh, 160 years' time. And as a consequence, another 28 million lives are expected to be lost at the current trajectory by the end of that sustainable development goal period. Words are not enough. What we have to do is translate the commitments which have already been made by the world's leaders and which we hope will be made uh, on the 26th of September into specific actions that are taken at various levels, but in particular specific actions that are taken by individual governments. And without those specific actions, we can continue to expect that we will remain off course in tackling uh, tuberculosis. 
And the importance of specific actions, and that means specific targets, being agreed in the declaration at the high-level meeting, is that only then, only if there are specifics, can the world's leaders be held to account for delivering against those requirements. That is why they are so important. And if there are generalized commitments, it is too easy for governments to wriggle away from them and too easy for them not to be clear about what it is that they actually have to do or for those who hold those governments to account in each country, elected representatives such as myself, civil society members, all of the NGOs who will be clamoring for more action, uh, it will be much harder for them if their heads of government are able to say, oh, well, we've done this, but there isn't a specific that enables the, those who are holding that head of government to account to say, yes, but you haven't done enough. Look how you've missed this target. And that's why it is so important that we press for these specific measures to be included uh, in the high-level declaration. We shouldn't be frightened of targets because they give something that the world's leaders, that elected politicians can aim for. We know that there is a funding gap. We've heard about that, and uh, we know that funding needs uh, to be doubled. Uh, and I think it's important to realize that th the reason we need specific uh, targets is how can we expect to uh, hold heads of government uh, and those who work with them uh, to account for commitments to fund tuberculosis if we don't actually know how much we're expecting them to fund. I mean, there is a huge non sequitur there. They need to know what it is they have to do, and we need to be able to identify how much more those governments need to spend, not just what the global gap is, but what the individual gap is. And, and that's, uh, that's particularly true in research and investment, where there is ma uh, uh, research and investment, where there is uh, research and development, where there is massive market failure uh, and, and absent government action and absent government funding, we will not have the, um, uh, the uh, increase in research and development that we all keep clamoring for. So there needs to be an increase uh, of funding met both uh, multilaterally, and we've heard of the need to replenish the global fund, uh, met individually in country, but also met through the continuation and the increase of bilateral programs. Don't, don't let's overlook the importance uh, of those. Yes, the cost is not insignificant. Another six or seven billion dollars a year is not insignificant. But it is, it is uh, uh, compared to the overall costs of not tackling this disease. I mentioned that we are so dramatically off target in meeting the sustainable development goal. The cost to the global economy of missing that goal over that 15-year period will be one trillion billion dollars. A thousand billion dollars, cumulatively, the cost of missing that goal. That dwarfs any cost of increasing uh, investment in uh, 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 TB uh, programs and research and development. Let me make um, one final point. It is no use us just petitioning health ministers or even just finance ministers. It is heads of government who have the authority and can exercise the leadership to drive the necessary action and to authorize the increase in investment that is needed for tuberculosis. And that is why it is so important that all of us work so hard to get our heads of government to attend the high-level meeting on the 26th of September as the United Nations General Assembly resolution specifically invites them to do. Words are not enough. We need the heads of government uh, to be there. We need them to make specific commitments uh, to act and with the funding to match so that we can hold them to account uh, at, to account 
for achieving the end to be, uh, to TB. And that is what they owe their electorates, and that is what they owe the world's poorest and those who are dying. That is what they owe the 1.7 million people a year who have continued to lose their lives from this terrible disease. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. And I have to say it's very refreshing to be hearing from a member of parliament who's calling for enough of rhetorics. Usually, it's civil society will call um, representatives of government um, about that. So that's good to hear. We've heard very clearly that words are not enough. Of course, uh, the outcome declaration would set the tone and the pace and the framework for how countries work on their TB programs and commitments. But it's not enough without specific actions, uh, without specific targets and goals. So we have to make sure that the outcome the declaration of the high-level meeting is as concrete and it also has specific costing and to make sure that our governments also commit to funding. We have to make sure that they put the money where their mouth is. And that's a job for all of us. Um, so thanks to all the panelists, we would now open the floor for interventions um, from the audience. Um, we have a list. We would start the queue with the um, United States mission, and then Stop AIDS, and then LHL International. Um, we first go with these three um, interventions. Um, uh, United States um, mission, please uh, pressure microphones to be queued. Thank you very much, Madam thank Chair. You. And thank you to the interesting panelists and all the interesting remarks that have been made from the floor as well. We are very pleased to see more attention on the need for the development of new drugs to improve treatment for all people with TB. According to recent reports, the United States government's funding for global TB R&D makes up almost 60% of the world's investments. We would like to take this opportunity to point out that most existing treatment drugs for TB are off patent and inexpensive, and that of the two newer drugs, one is donated and the other currently has limited use according to WHO guidelines. Given the vast number of people with TB, that the vast number of people with TB are undiagnosed and that this is a treatable disease, it would seem to be a better use of global efforts to focus on improving health systems, preventive measures, and development of new tools rather than be distracted as we often are into a discussion of access to medicines, intellectual property flexibilities, or compulsory licensing. Investing in reaching the neglected or overlooked populations appears to be the main action needed globally, but even more importantly, at national levels. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we now give the floor to LH LH LHL International. Hello? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, coming from Norway, I want to specifically address the high-income, low-burden countries. TB has been severely underfunded for decades, and I think we have to admit that we have failed up until now. But now we have the chance. But it needs to be a joint effort. Low-burden countries, like Norway, can no, lo can no longer say we thought TB was a th disease of the past. With this HLM, we will all know that is, it is of the present. Increased domestic financing is very important. Countries must ensure the rights of their own TB patients. But increased domestic financing will not be enough. We need 13 billion US dollars annually for TB prevention and care. And we know we also need, need new and more effective medicines. We do need that. Uh, affordable point of care diagnostics and new vaccine. So this is the ask. Wealthy nations need to step up, dig deep, and commit real funding. Let's not fail again. Too many people have suffered and died. In addition to funding, we need real political commitment. 
So we need to have heads of state present at HLM, not only from high burden, in, high burden countries, but also from low burden countries like Norway. And we need an accountability framework with specific targets, not only to ensure that our money is well spent and reaches people, but also a framework that monitors and ensures human rights-based approach, people-centered care, and meaningful participation and involvement of civil society. And we need this HLM not to be a one-off. Let's be serious this time. Let's do right about TB. Let's keep the pressure and momentum up with Secretary General deliver delivering annual updates and with that HLM every five years until we've ended TB. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we go to stop aids. Mike, sorry, the, the microphone isn't turned on yet. Hello? Is that working? Is that working? It's working now, yeah, thanks. Great. Thanks. My name is Mike Podmore. My statement relates to how we generate increased financing and responsibility for TB by domestic governments, particularly in middle-income countries if key external donors exit. The challenge of how to generate political will within domestic gov governments to increase funding and provide accessible TB services is hard to solve. It takes time and effort. It is clear that very few domestic governments have simply stepped up when donors have pulled out funding without meaningful preparation and planning for sustainability. Yet this key challenge to TB, TB and broader health is not yet addressed in the zero draft outcome document. We therefore call for the inclusion of text within the outcome document for donors and multilaterals to commit to only transition funding out of a country when the TB epidemic is under control in that country, or at least at minimum, when all relevant stakeholders have agreed and take ownership of a clear transition plan in that country that will ensure a sustainable TB response for the immediate future. Transition plans must be based on comprehensive transition readiness assessments that generate a clear set of mitigation strategies that will prevent TB epidemic resurgence. I also want to highlight the need for ongoing support for post-transition countries. Even when domestic political will is present to fund and address TB, many countries face additional challenges that take time and multiple actors to solve. One such challenge is domestic procurement of TB drugs during and after transition. Emerging evidence shows that during transition, countries are being required to progressively take up the costs of TB commodities, but are ill-equipped to do so for multiple reasons. This is contributing to split markets, and countries are experiencing problems such as failed tenders, drug stockouts, and higher drug prices. We therefore also call on member states and multilaterals like the Global Fund to urgently commit to the convening of a core group of key stakeholders and experts to review these challenges, and develop tools and support to help countries navigate and overcome these procurement challenges. Without these swift and comprehensive steps, we risk squandering global investment and seriously undermining efforts to achieve sustainability of programs and our goal to end TB. Thank you. Thank you very much, Top Aids. For the next um, round of interventions, I would be calling on first the Brazilian mission and then product development partnerships going to four impacts in social health or FIS in Cameroon and then Center for Health Policies and Studies, Stop TB Partnership Kenya and GCTA. So we call on the Brazilian mission please to make their floor intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Uh, so I want to thank the PGA for convening this meeting, uh, which will be pivotal for the success of the negotiations of the political declaration, which, uh, as we know, will start tomorrow. Uh, will be a uh, very important source of uh, inputs for all the member states who will uh, negotiate the document. Uh, I know that we are here today to listen to the civil society representatives, but uh, allow me to very briefly react to some of the insightful uh, comments made here today. 
I'd like to, in particular, acknowledge uh, the comments made and the, actually the, the strong and encouraging uh, call for action made by Dr. Tevra uh, referring to BRICS countries. Uh, Brazil, as a high border country, is uh, fully committed to scaling up TB prevention, diagnosis, uh, treatment, and care. And just also very briefly, uh, I'd like to say that uh, in 2017, uh, we had two important milestones in this regard. One of, uh, the, one of those, uh, in the national level, uh, we launched our national plan for ending TB. And in international level, as Dr. Tavra mentioned, uh, we launched uh, together with, with the other BRICS countries, our uh, research network. So uh, I think that I just would like to take the floor to, to, to mention this and to say that are fully committed also to pursue these targets uh, in close collaborations with so civil society both in national and uh, international level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the leadership of Brazil, including in the area of um, research and development for TB and the openness to work with civil society. Um, we now go to product development partnerships. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, dear, dear colleagues. Um, notwithstanding significant underfunding of R&D and new tools that we've heard about, uh, a lot of progress has been made in the last 15 years. Uh, 15 years ago, there was only one candidate in the clinical pipeline for a vaccine candidate. Today, there are 14 with several more in preclinical development. We can now detect TB as well as rifampicin resistance in decentralized settings um, and have re reduced the time to do so from uh, days or weeks to hours. Um, we also have 30 projects in the treatment development pipeline and the first and fully novel regimen for dealing with drug resistant TB set to get approval over the next few years. So we can therefore be bold and we should be. And to capitalize on the progress of the last couple of years, um, we need to have a significant growth of the investment in TB uh, and TB R&D. Currently there are only um, five donors that together form more than half um, of the funding in R&D overall. Only three donors together that do that basically fund uh, almost 80% of product development, um, one of them being a non-state actor. Um, TB is, however, a disease uh, impacting every country and specifically a large number of emerging economy. So a more diverse and global commitment to fund R&D is truly needed. We therefore urge member states to ensure that the political declarations commit to tripling the overall annual investment in TB R&D and further urge for all member states to commit their fair share of the global funding need. The declaration must reiterate commitments made to support international and national collaborations in research and new product development, as well as the collaboration in funding, through engagement of domestic, international, and innovative financing mechanisms and the use of appropriate incentive mechanisms. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have FIS Cameroon. Merci. Merci, Madame Lam. Thank you, Madam Moderator. We are honored to be able to take the floor during this high-level assembly. I just wanted to clarify that we need to make every effort to, leave, to ensure we leave no one behind. And I also wish to call upon you to take a look at the data and the countries that have the most difficult uh, s results in diagnoses. I have, for example, Guinea-Bissau with 33% of coverage in treatment, Ghana 32% in coverage, in Cabo Verde 34%, Chad 49%, Congo, 54%, DRC 51%, 55% for Cameroon. In reality, this is very far behind the results and the achievements laid out in 2015. Here, if there isn't stronger 
action undertaken, these countries will be very far from the achievements needed for 2020 and 2030. But what is the nature of these countries? These countries are those whose GDPs are very low. These are poor countries. And if these are countries that are poor, that means that the efforts needed and solidarity needed must be focused on these countries so that by 2020 and 2030, the results can change. Madam Moderator, I just wanted here to draw the attention of this assembly to the fact that in March 2017, the directors of TB programs in various different countries in Africa uh, signed the Cotonou Declaration, which lays out the commitments made. This declaration calls for greater financing of the TB response in these countries, which have very poor results, and if efforts are not made, nothing will change. Perhaps I should also add that in these uh, appeals, we are regret to note that the countries I just listed and their diplomatic missions are falling behind, are, dra are dragging their feet to discuss these issues with civil society. And I think that everyone must move forward, must mobilize, so that we will be able to ha contribute uh, appropriately to this fight. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Now we give the floor to Center for Health Policies and Studies, Moldova. Thank you, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, on behalf of the representatives of the civil society and community organizations from Eastern Europe and Central Asia who are engaged in promoting people-centered model of TB care, we would like to stress that in our countries, the multi-drug resistant TB is an acute challenge and the main obstacle to effectively addressing the TB epidemic. Mainly, high burden MDR-TB is due to long and unnecessary hospitalization. TB is curable, and in 21st century, it can be managed mostly on an ambulatory basis, limiting hospital stays only when the clinical status requires it. The ambulatory treatment is less expensive and is closest to the needs of people. In order to find additional financing for TB response uh, epidemic, political commitment and action is needed to, uh, for including the people-centered model of uh, TB care concept in the overall health system reform agenda and implement it as fast as possible. Ensure that any plan to reduce hospitalization provides for effective mechanisms to maintain the funding and reallocate to higher quality clinical and patient support services and newer diagnostics and treatment options. Linking providing provider payment mechanisms to performance investments based, to performance improvements based, including quality and integration support the design and implementation of the new model of TB care in the context of the broader health and social systems with special attention to service integration with other health programs. We are asking for your personal and your government's commitment to be agents of change to transform the TB services in a cost-efficient and effective manner. Thank you. Thank you very much. In the interest of keeping within time, we'll be able to accommodate three more interventions from the floor, and these are from Stop TB Partnership Kenya, GCTA, and representative of the government of Indonesia, so that we'll be able to give a chance to our panelists to respond to the interventions as well as do the wrap-up. So Stop TB Partnership Kenya, you now have the floor. discussion around uh, funding for TB for better diagnostics, treatment, and even prevention. But we must make deliberate efforts to mitigate the, uh, the impacts of TB, of, the, of TB treatment on the patients themselves. And this comes in terms of uh, 
transport, food, and also other costs that come with management of uh, side effects of TB treatment. I want to demonstrate this uh, through a story of, of young Joyce. In the month of April, we lost young Joyce, 12 year old girl, who died from complications from MDR-TB. But the story is not in her death. The story is in the catastrophic costs that she incurred during treatment and even in her death as she lays in her grave. During the treatment, Joyce's uh, lungs collapsed, was, got so damaged that she had to be put on an oxygen concentrator machine to support her breathing. The father, who is just a construction worker, had to conduct um, fundraisers to raise uh, $1,000, the cost of the concentrator machine. Unfortunately, from a power blackout, because the machine was electric, Joyce died when the machine failed to work. As at the time of her death, Joyce's bill in hospital had escalated to 12,000 US dollars. To this day, the father is still paying the bill even after the daughter's death. He committed to be paying this at the rate of US dollars 15 because that's all what he could afford. This will take him 66 years to clear at that rate. The story of Joyce represents other TB patients globally who have to grapple with high catastrophic costs that they incur in the process of treatment, in the process of managing the side effects that come along MDR-TB treatment, like it has been mentioned uh, by other speakers, like loss of hearing, damaged lungs, and others. The TB, the NTB strategy highlights ending catastrophic T, uh, cost related to, to TB as a target for 2030. We, are, we, are, we recommend that mitigating the impact of high cost related to TB be given a priority even as we, even as we think about ending TB and even as we think about the upcoming high level meeting in September. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now give the floor to the Global Coalition of TB Activists, GCTA. Even though TB affects both men and women, women are disproportionately affected, particularly as far as stigma and discrimination is concerned. Stigma, both self and community stigma, is a big barrier to accessing treatment. There is a saying that if we invest, if there is a saying, sorry, that if you educate a woman, you educate the entire family. Women are primary caregivers. And like we heard in the previous panel, parliamentarian Angelina Tan's family nearly starved to death after her mother's diagnosis with TB. If we focus and invest in our women, the benefits are many. We give strength to the entire family and the community benefits multifold. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as our last intervention from the floor, we call on the representative of the government of Indonesia Thank you, Madam Moderator, for the opportunities given. Indonesia is one of the highest country or highest uh, burden countries for tuberculosis. No government can achieve this alone. Active involvement by the people is crucial. Therefore, in Indonesia, we are working very hard to raise the awareness of the civil society and to get them involved. In Indonesia, fighting against TB has become a serious national priority. The president has given full support to NTB by 2030. A number of concrete supports include fully financing the programs to eliminate TB, estab establishing TB mandatory notification, which emphasizes public-private cooperation, nationwide health coverage that includes treatment for TB patients, and research and development to find enhanced cure for TB. 
TB as a global threat requires a global response. Indonesia is ready to join the global community to fight against TB. I also wish to highlight that as a member of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, Indonesia has recently been selected as the OIC's Center of Excellence for Vaccine and Biotechnology, through which we stand ready to cooperate with other countries in developing vaccine and biotechnology. Finally, we look forward to hear from more today's discussion, and Indonesia stands ready to support the success of the upcoming high-level meeting of, on TB this September. I thank you. Thank you very much, and we're running really behind schedule, so I would now give the floor, the mic back to the panelists. I would start from this end. And just as a request, a challenge as well, if you could keep it to one minute, final words and message and also responses um, based on what we've heard from the interventions. Um, take it away, Carol. Uh, thank you for all the interventions. Uh, so I think I really want to uh, concentrate on what uh, the colleague from Kenya talked about, uh, the, the, the little Joyce who died. So if we do not take a deliberate move to mitigate the costs uh, to access to health, even if uh, in most cases we say in our country that TB is free, we we'll still have, uh, we we'll still lose lives in as much as we put together uh, uh, good um, services. It took me about a year for TB to be diagnosed in my case where I went back and forth because what I had was extra pulmonary TB and they could not find it. I was lucky that I had a family that could support me. Otherwise, I don't think I'd be sitting here today. Which is why for me, I think it's really important, like other people said, to support uh, community health workers. These are the foot soldiers. These are the people who go into the communities. This would also actually support in the areas where we are saying that, you know, catastrophic costs, people are not able to go to hospitals. They're able to follow the patients in the, in the communities, uh, uh, do sputum, community sputum collection, and when they find out the cases, they can actually take the medication. So which is why for me, my core is that to, uh, community health workers should be supported mm -hmm so that they can go in the community and this will help reduce some of the costs we're talking about. Thanks, Carol. Marijke. Thank you very much. And really difficult to summarize what was a very rich discussion in one minute. Uh, two key observations. One, that there's a very high degree of consensus and convergence in all of the speakers. And for me, I was reflecting what does it mean. I think it means two things. First of all, that we're preaching to the converted. And um, it's very much the community, the B community talking amongst themselves, so we really have to broaden. The second, it's, we don't need a lot of more policies and guidance documents, we need action. No words, no action. Um, the second reflection is that uh, modesty is a highly overrated virtue. And I think that the B community over the last decades has been far too modest. It's time that we stop being happy with the crumbles that are being thrown at us and demand the cake. So what does the cake mean? It means that we, we demand better tools, uh, shorter regimens um, with less side effects. Uh, we need more investments in a vaccine, in better diagnostic uh, tools. Uh, we need more domestic funding. We need a fully funded global fund. And I think the intervention from Cameroon highlighted that external funding is still very critical and life-saving for many countries. And we need all heads of states to be at a high level meeting to commit to action a specific target. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marijke. Melchiades, please. I'd like to stress something we already know, that it is possible to eliminate TB with real commitment, specific actions on the part of every nation. I know we can succeed in ending TB, and it's a great hope and desire in my heart and with my family. Thank you. Thank you, Melchiades. Um, Nick? If you look at uh, all of the world's problems, this is not the hardest to deal with. TB has been beatable since the discovery of antibiotics. And it is frankly to the shame of the world's community 
that so many people have lost their lives and will continue to lose their lives simply because we do not mobilize the resources and the action that's necessary to tackle it. So my message to the world's leaders uh, would be uh, to attend and to agree the necessary action. And if 1.7 million lives lost a year totally unnecessarily is not enough to persuade you to come, what is? Thank you. Ezio? Well, uh, if I would have some words to the world leaders, uh, I want indicators. I want uh, figures that uh, they will commit and we will uh, follow up with them. Uh, there is one aspect that I would like to highlight to finalize, that is the importance some, uh, some of my colleagues have already done, the, the importance of the community uh, and the community um, uh, engagement in all areas, in policy making, in TB policy making. So it's crucial that in the document it's, it's reflected that uh, uh, there are uh, reserved spaces in all policy making area in health to have community uh, presence. And also in research, it sounds strange, but we have been doing that for a long time. And the, 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 the cost effectiveness is obvious. I mean, look at HIV and AIDS, what they have done. What would be about the response on HIV and AIDS if it would not be the communities? So we have, uh, and look at the, the, the donors, uh, what the donors did to the funding for research in HIV and AIDS. They require to have community advisory boards to have funding provided. We have to do the same in TB. We have to guarantee that uh, communities uh, 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 sit together with researchers and in the policy making area. And that has costs. People think that the communities and, uh, and uh, people affected can work for free and that that has no cost and that they would be available and they don't need funding. They do. This has cost. This has to be in uh, the account. Thank you so much. I would like to sincerely thank each of the panelists as well as everyone for a very um, interactive and insightful discussion. Just to quickly wrap up, um, if everybody, if everyone in this room, if our governments are really serious about ending TB in this lifetime, we know that we have to invest the right amount in the right interventions, including in community-led and community-based approaches, services, and programs. The issue of meeting the funding gaps to lodge an effective and sustainable TB response is not just a fiscal or a financial issue, it's an issue of political will. If our governments have been spending trillions of US dollars for militarization, for wars that actually kills lives, why are not willing, why are not we willing to spend a smaller amount to lodge a war against TB, which actually saves lives? So with that, thank you very much. And before we leave for lunch, I would actually call upon Bless Blessy Kumar, who is the head of the Global Coalition of TB, TB Activists, for an announcement. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We've heard a lot about community and we've heard a lot about stigma. And just to kind of bring both those together, we have a launch of a book, um, which basically is stories of women from around the globe, how they overcame TB and MDR and XDR TB, the stigma they went through, some heart-wrenching stories which will move you to tears. We're very grateful that Dr. Luchika Ditu has written the foreword for it, and we have a message from Dr. Teresa. And unfortunately, we couldn't have the women, all of them who are featured in the book here with us, because of various constraints that communities face every day. But we do have one of them here, and we have representatives from the regions who will help release this book with uh, Dr. Luchika and Dr. Teresa. Thank you very much. We have um, Ria Lobo, survivor, who will launch the book. Evelyn from Kenya, who represents Africa. 
We have Yulia, who represents Europe, and we have Kathy, who represents Latin America and the Caribbean. Luchika and Teresa, if you'd like to release the book and say a few words. Okay. I am just getting advice that we need to release the interpreters. Our I think you can release. I want to say something because everyone knows me sure. here. I think the interpreters can go. I don't think we have every day a stigma a book written by women. And I think the women here and Blessy deserve the respect to be listened. The interpreters can go and eat. Thank you. So thanks to the interpreters for, um, and, and then you're now released. TV leader, as a doctor, as a mother, uh, I would like to raise my voice jointly with this fantastic woman against stigma. And uh, this book is not for the relax, it's not for the evening reading, it's for carefully, very carefully reading, it's for crying, for thinking, become stronger and acting as soon as possible. Together we'll end TV. Thank you very much.